convene a joint meeting of the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of Health. Welcome everyone to Harris Hall. Mr. Moker Heisky, good afternoon. Hello. Any uh, emergency business or adjustments to the agenda? No. Very good. Then I'll allow your panel a moment to uh, assemble for our 1.30 time certain. I'm sorry, we're about 90 seconds late for your time certain. We have a great team here, and I'm going to turn it over to Jocelyn Warren, our public health manager, who you heard from earlier today, uh, to introduce the, the panel and the item itself. Okay, great. Chair Farr and commissioners, thank you for having us today. We're um, very excited to be here and, and really appreciate the invitation to discuss the report that the subcommittee of our Public Health Advisory Committee um, put together and submitted um, about the importance of ACEs and impact on the community and some recommendations for um, mitigating those effects in our community. So we, we do have a great panel here today. We have Sarah McCrory and Eric Collander from our Public Health Advisory Committee and also Chelsea Whitney, the nursing supervisor for our family and child health section, who is a um, our resident expert in all things ACEs and early childhood. So um, that is, and we're going to start a little bit with talking about ACEs and why ACEs um, and the, the, just the concept itself is important. It has evolved somewhat over time, and that is one of the reasons why we asked Chelsea to join us, because um, as the research develops, it's also important that we kind of have a more current understanding um, of what we know about ACEs and the community effects. So. Um, um, I've asked each of um, Chelsea and Sarah and Eric to talk a little bit about um, why ACEs is important to them personally and why this has been something that has um, really inspired them in their work and in their service to our county. Chelsea, would you like to start? Sure. My name is Chelsea Whitney and I'm our family and child health nursing supervisor. And in that role, I supervise and support a team that serves new families throughout Lane County in every geographic community. We work with folks beginning in pregnancy, and I think this is an exciting piece as we talk about ACEs and we talk about resiliency, because the crux of this work to me is about helping families heal and preventing adversity in the next generation. And that begins by engaging with families at the soonest possible moment, ideally as soon as they know that they're pregnant, which is the heart of our programs. And what I think is really important to know about ACEs is I care deeply about this work and our team cares deeply about this work because every single resident in Lane County is impacted by this. The vast majority of adults in our community have experienced at least one adverse event in our childhood, and the vast, vast majority have experienced multiple um, of one nature or of another. So there's a lot of, of deep impacts and a lot of healing that's possible. So that's really, I think, my focus is that when we support families and we support them early on, we can help our current adults who are parenting heal and we can create prevention efforts in the next generation. So the future generations, our little children growing up today, are healthier than the previous. Hi, my name is Eric Cullender. I appear before you as a retired ordinary citizen. I've been dealing with ACEs all my life, not personally, although as Chelsea said, probably everyone has had ACEs. But uh, when I became a camp, camp, camp counselor, when I became a physician's assistant and worked in the NICU, when I became a uh, <coughs> practitioner at a general pediatric clinic, when I taught high school, and now when I volunteer at our local elementary school, I deal with ACEs every single day. So I've been dealing with ACEs and the effects of ACEs uh, my whole entire life. And what, I, what really drives me is I, I see every day uh, the effect of ACEs. And I'd, I'd really like to break that cycle. And so I just keep pushing away as much as I can to see, as a society, can we make uh, growing up a more enjoyable experience for so many of our population? And can we help those who have had ACEs uh, regain more of a productive life? Hi, my name is Sarah McCrory. Excuse me. How's that? A little bit better. Sarah McCrory, I am an operations executive. I have backgrounds in um, women's reproductive health care, midwifery specifically, and also clinical care. So I come through health care and also now am in the business community. And I find this topic to be just incredibly important because it's really a keystone topic, right? We're talking about how individuals manifest in society ultimately. And 
ACEs have huge impacts both at the economic and societal level and also at the personal and healthcare level. So not only are we going to see really strong economic impacts to our society if we allow ACEs to kind of continue to be a feature of childhood, but we're also seeing a lot of healthcare related impacts. So more heart disease, more diabetes, more other, you know, problems that have, again, fiscal impacts and productivity impacts in society. I'm particularly interested in looking at kind of the macro impacts and the way that we can use um, economics to prevent ACEs and to support our community and um, think about the way that it plays out at the broader level rather than so much the individual level. And that just happens to be the focus that I'm interested in. Um, I think it's a really compelling argument for addressing this problem in our community. Thank you, Sarah. So what we thought we would do today, and I, I do actually want to back up for anyone that, who might be listening, I think we jumped right to ACEs without kind of discussing what ACEs is. So um, just to um, be really clear and um, make sure we're all on the same page. So ACEs collectively refers to the adverse childhood experiences. It's a category of 10 potentially traumatic events. And these have been updated over time as well and also why we've invited Chelsea here because um, she is very well versed in this research. But these are traumatic events that occur during childhood and that have lifelong impacts on behavioral, mental, and um, physical health. So uh, those categories have been studied extensively. And um, the, actually, the commitment to ACEs began, I think, in Health and Human Services back around 2014 when there was mandated training for everyone who worked in Health and Human Services. And so we've continued that studying um, through um, trauma-informed care and some of our other initiatives as well. Um, but to just to give that kind of background and framework. So now we're just, we don't have a presentation. We're just going to kind of walk through our, um, the report and we're going to turn it over to Sarah who will um, walk through um, what we submitted there. I Thanks, agree. Sarah. Thanks. Eric and I are gonna kind of take some different parts of this to talk it through. Um, assuming that you guys all had a chance to peruse the report and look through it, but you know, really just a couple of things about the report. One is this effort took a really long time. Um, it, you know, this is a volunteer effort. As PHAC members, we come together pretty infrequently. And this report started about two years ago. So even some of the data and information in the report has evolved. Um, and also some of the way that the timing of our recommendations fell with legislative sessions and budgeting sessions and kind of, you know, our original intentions for how these recommendations would come forward have kind of not necessarily lined up with timing with other processes. So we're hoping today to be able just to have a conversation about the underlying intent and the underlying actions that we think should be pushed forward. Um, very much hoping that we could make recommendations that were actionable, things that could actually have an impact. It's such um, a wild problem and it's really all encompassing. I think one of the original struggles of the ACES subcommittee was that finding a point of entry into solving this problem was very difficult, right? A lot of our early meetings were kind of spent articulating, well, this leads to this and this leads to this and then you get this problem. So actually finding those points of entry was one of our main goals and figuring out how we can create some really effective change. Um, the first set of recommendations that we came up with, so recommendation one was very much for supporting the early childhood tax credits. We believe that economic impact is a really effective starting point. It's kind of a Pareto principle type thing where you can get a lot of bang for your buck by improving the economic situation of families. Removing economic stressors removes a lot of the kind of downstream ACEs that people experience. Certainly by no means all of them, but you can actually get a lot of effective change through allowing families to not have some of the economic pressures that people are experiencing. Um, so child tax credits have been shown to be effective at that. We actually had a really amazing case study during the pandemic with the expanded childhood tax credit. Um, Columbia University is kind of the forerunner on studying that. The economists there have done a lot of research on it and 
really been able to show the impressive impacts that it had for families. And I believe that something along those lines would be really helpful for families in Lane County, just taking some of the economic pressures off of people. We also know that direct giving in the form of tax credits or other forms of direct giving are really effective for families, and that families just use that money for what they need it for. They pay the rent with it, they buy food with it, they pay for health insurance and health care um, and other basic needs. So I am really for that as a way of reducing some of the stressors that family experience, families experience. Um, any questions about that? No? So the second recommendation was very much around child care. Child care, am I? Am I going off topic? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's the nature of our work. <laughs> that's it. That's Eric's. Um, so do you want to talk about child care? Why don't you go ahead and take this one? I, I hardly need to talk to you folks about child care because I'm sure you've discussed this numerous times. But the ability to afford child care and even the ability to have child care is rapidly declining uh, in Lane County as well as all over the United States, in particular in Lane County with the pandemic. Many child care providers went out of business. So if you're lucky enough to try to find and you find a child care provider, can you afford it? And the answer for most young families is no. So right away, we expose our youngsters to a situation where they're not making the kind of developmental progress that more privileged kids get and fall behind from the get-go. And so, you know, what can we do about that? And we knew that it would not be a good idea for us to come to you and say, hey, let's have you give a lot of money to child care, but I think there's a lot of things that we could do to try to uh, make the increase in child care providers possible, to make their ability to form a business possible, uh, and to increase the number of children that are served by child care. And in child care, we define it zero to three. Is that what we would land it on? Oh, it was zero to two. Zero to two. Yeah, and then three to five. Then three to five, zero to two, and three to five. And as I'll say a little bit later on, this is what I see every day when uh, I'm volunteering in the first grade and a first grader walks in and doesn't know it, the alphabet, much less the sounds that the letters in the alphabet make. So now they're a full year plus behind those kids that have had preschool. And if the kids of their cohorts have had both childcare and preschool, social emotional aspects are behind. So there's a ton of energy spent in trying to get these kids up to the point where they can actually be a productive member of the class. It doesn't have a lot to do with academics. Academics can't happen until the child can actually be part of the class. So instantly we take a large segment of our population and put them behind and put them in an unequal situation with their peers. And just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, the economic development or the economic supports and the childcare really go hand in hand. We know that participation in the workforce is very strongly impacted by access to childcare. And so they're really just the same issue, different sides of the coin of the same issue, really. Um, the third recommendation that we made was to support opening a relief nursery in Florence. And I think it's very easy for me, because I live in Eugene, to get very focused on what is happening in Eugene and Springfield. But we need to remember that Lane County is very large, and there are a lot of rural areas in this county. And the relief nursery has been shown to be a very effective intervention program. And talking to folks out in Florence, talking to folks on the coast. This is something that I think could be really beneficial to the community, just an additional layer of support for folks who are at risk in that community. Um, so developing that and just supporting that in terms of fiscal support, in terms of um, throwing your weight behind that would be very valuable to the community in Florence and Lane County at large. Quite frankly, when I heard there was no relief nursery in Florence, I was shocked. I mean, then I found out that there's no relief nursery on the entire Oregon coast. And I went, uh, left behind once again. The coast has a lot of people living on it. And we, as members of the Willamette Valley, we tend to forget all of, all of our constituents that live on the coast and, and their needs. And I shouldn't maybe pejorative to say forget. We don't forget, but we don't reach them adequately. That's probably a little bit fair. Uh, recommendation number four is near and dear to my heart. I spend a lot of time, and I continue to spend a lot of time in education. And I've already mentioned that I volunteer in a reading program in a local elementary school that I go to, and it just breaks my heart when I compare how I was able to grow up with a 
whole lot of kids that come into this elementary school and how ill prepared they are to do elementary school. So in addition to childcare, which remember is not only beginning education, but learning how to act in a social and emotional way to merge with society, uh, starting to learn uh, those letters and the letter sounds, phonemes, starting to be able to learn about segmentation. I won't go into the educational talk, but basically starting to learn how to read doesn't start in first grade, it doesn't start in kindergarten, although for many kids it does. So if we could, this is the three to five a year age group, if we could figure out ways as a community, as a, a county, as a state, as a nation, to, to guarantee to our kids and their families that we they do have access to preschool, it would make a huge difference in everything that we're concerned about. And when I read the little bullet bi uh, biographies about what the five of you are interested in, it's in perfect match with what we're talking about, except we're starting at birth to try to make a more equitable society for everybody who lives in it. So preschool for all would be wonderful. It's not impossible. Uh, Multnomah County, as some of you know, uh, passed a voter initiative <coughs> uh, guaranteeing preschool for all, and they're slowly but surely ramping that up. Lane County is not Multnomah County, I know that. Uh, but the idea is there, when you take a look at other countries, the so-called industrialized first world countries, they all do a much better job than we do in getting their kids ready for school and supporting them while they're in school and their families. It just seems to me it's high time to start recognizing that and do what we can do, in this case at the county level, to try to bring that up to speed. That's our, oh, we limited ourselves to three recommendations. I just finished talking about the fourth. Yeah. You might want to know, how come you didn't talk about this and this and this and this and this and this and this? We wanted to. Uh, but as Sarah alluded to, this is just such a protean issue that we said, okay, let's get a more, thanks to her, nobody wants to hear 15 recommendations. So this is why we ended up with those four. And if you say, why, why didn't you consider this or that? We'll probably say we did, and we'd love it if that could happen, too. Uh, should we open to questions? Absolutely. I think this being a work session is a little different from um, the type of presentation we're used to. So we'll take our cue from you about how you would like to proceed. Well, we'll uh, move into questions from the board or comments from the board initially, and we'll go in maybe a couple of rounds there. Um, I usually wait and try to wait until last unless nobody else raises their hand, so I'm going to look for hands raised. Commercial level, Thank <laughs> followed you, by Chair. commercial book. Uh, what I noticed that struck out to me when you guys were uh, talking about this was, Sarah, you said that this was uh, a report that came from volunteer efforts. So all of you for volunteering your time and being passionate about kids and the growth and, and the ACEs crisis that we have. Thank you for doing that. That's a huge commitment. And I know volunteer uh, work, Eric, as we get to be our age, uh, time is something we value a lot of, yes? Yeah, we have grandkids and all that stuff, so thank you very much. Um, you said something too, Eric, that I want to go back to, because sometimes when we talk about things, we tend to like say things in, in the air of dramatics so that people can understand the depth of the issue, but you said something that a large segment are behind, if not exposed to social and basic learning, like th those kinds. So I'm a numbers guy, so help me out. What we, we're talking about a, a large segment. What proportion or percentage do you think of young kids in our county are that far behind as a large segment? Do you want me to talk about urban areas or rural areas? Uh, both, that would be a complete answer to the question. I would love that. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm from a rural part of the county and uh, there are fewer opportunities in rural parts of the county for this kind of thing. So uh, I would say that uh, just as a seat of the pants statistic, about half the kids come into kindergarten with no knowledge of uh, alphabet and the sounds that the letters make. The other half, some of them are actually reading. So that's, that's the disparity. So it's a large number. So that's in the, in the rural district you're still, or you're still talking general? Is I'm that talking specific mostly to about rural because right. I, I taught high school rural Cottage Grove, I'm volunteering rural <clears throat> in Cresswell. So that's my biggest experience. You know, if I was volunteering in uh, Bethel, Springfield, Eugene, I could find similar areas that are similar to the rural area, but uh, a quite significant number so that the, uh, not only do the kindergarten teachers have to assume that they can't just launch into the brand new curriculum, they have to immediately start, and there's a huge staff for, for lack of a better word, catch up. So there are so many people at that elementary school that are involved in intervention. 
level one, level two, level three. Right now they have over 200 kids in K through five, mostly K through three, in intervention to try to catch them up. So when you have a school that's about 550 and you have over 200 that are in intervention, uh, those numbers are pretty loud and clear. Yeah, it's a huge drain on the staff, as you'd mentioned, for sure. Yeah, and then, then it gets even more complicated, and I'll just make this really brief. What happens during the summer? So the same kids that didn't get the childcare, the same kids that didn't get preschool usually don't have books at home. Mm. So if you're not reading, if you don't use it, you lose it. So they come behind, they make progress. They're smart kids, most of them. They make progress, but then they go back to households that don't have the resources and who may multi in a multi-generational fashion don't have the resources. So they don't even know what their kids are missing and they fall further behind. So each cumulative year, they fall behind their peers, and the statistics for that is they start off about 10 to 12 months behind, and for each summer that they don't read, you can count on another six to eight months behind. So the gulf between those who have resources and those who don't have resources continues to grow, 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 grow. It's, yeah. Is that something, too, I was experiencing an open house for a mural in Springfield the other day about from the Smart Reader Program? Yes. And how does the Smart Reader Program and things like that could integrate into helping some of this? I mean, obviously, you're here because you're trying to get us to be interested in this event, which we are, but it takes money and it takes resources and all that. And, of course, everybody gets tired of throwing money at the problem when really there's other things that can help. So are, are we putting things into play in the county, like the Smart Reader Program and other things that we can help bridge some of those gaps that we're partnering with and put them all in the same room and get a plan? Uh, the <clears throat> answer is enough. Yes, and we could do more. So there is a smart reader program, and I was part of that initially. Uh, the volunteer I group with that I work with now at Crest Lane Elementary is an embedded program rather than a pull-out program and is there in every K through 3 class uh, during the reading period so it can break, go down into small reading groups. That's volunteers. Every single one there is nobody paid in these 38 adult volunteers. Could we gain interest amongst our population to do more volunteering and, and help set up some of the training that's needed so people can come into uh, the classroom <laughs> of young readers and help out. And it turns out that you don't have to be a retired teacher to do that, and you don't have to be a child psychologist to do that. All you have to do is have a heart and build relationships, and if the children see that you are building relationships with them, the blossoming starts almost immediately. So yeah, there's, there's an answer. That doesn't take any money, except for the fact that training would take some amount of money to get people uh, up to speed and feeling comfortable doing that. It's kind of intimidating unless you've done it before. Yeah, right. So that, that's one example. There are probably many other examples too. And then in our particular neck of the woods, we have a program where we have a book vending machine, <laughs> which is a vending machine. And uh, kids come up and with a little slip of paper, they're handed a gold token, they put it in, and just like any other vending machine, they push the buttons and out comes a free book they get to take home. So we're trying to populate all the homes in Crest, well, the Crest Lane School District with books at home so we can try to erase some of that disparity between those kids. That costs money, but we found that the local people who fund it are incredibly generous. They realize this is a program, it's, I mean, nobody's getting paid to implement it. I order the books, I stock the machine. <laughs> so, but there are lots of people are volunteering money. So yeah, there are things we can do. We don't have to just throw money at it. Um, I'm I no, I, I, That's I, okay. I, I, not at all. I, I really appreciate. <laughs> As you can see, this calls to be in. I mean, it, it's a, it is important, right? And the, the literacy piece of it is important because literacy, early literacy builds resilience, right? And early literacy itself is associated with a wide swath of positive outcomes for children as they grow. But I think also the focus on universal pre-K is more than about just literacy, right? If you look on page two of the report, you'll see there's a framework utilized by the CDC for addressing ACEs. And universal pre-K hits at least three of those factors that they're looking at. It promotes social norms that protect against violence and adversity. It ensures a strong start for children. It connects children and youth to caring adults and activities. And I would also argue that it teaches skills to caregivers, children, and youth as well. So the actual environment and the ability to be in, folded within the universal pre-K, you're, again, we're looking for bang for our buck, right? We're really looking for places where you can get a lot of impact, right? Because 
Yes, we have wonderful volunteer-driven kind of stopgap literacy measures in the community. I would argue that those should not go away and those should be supported at all costs. However, is it a one-to-one -one replacement for a universal pre-K program? I would also argue that that's not the case. In terms of our work aligning with yours, public safety, so if you consider a child who makes it all the way through high school, they're much less likely to get in trouble with the law. They're much more likely to go on to have a productive career to have a stable family and to be able to afford housing. So each one of the priorities that you mentioned as your primary interest are served by starting at the ground level and building up these kids' ability to succeed as citizens. It, and Chelsea, could you say something about the multi-generational aspect of this? Sure. So I think one of the things that's really near and dear to my heart and the program I directly supervise most heavily, Nurse Family Partnership, is that we see multi-generational impacts when we address adversity and promote resiliency in families. And what I mean by that is just one example is the program we here implement in Lane County called Nurse Family Partnership, where we start with first-time parents early in that first pregnancy, their first parenting journey, and we provide support to that parent around their own healing from any adversity they experienced. We support their economic connections. We support them getting their GED or their college diploma, connect them to community resources, and support that parent's healing, as well as teaching parenting skills and resources to prevent ACEs in their children, this baby that's not yet born, right, that's coming. That program has been researched intensively and heavily for decades now, and what I find really, really exciting research is we sometimes talk about what's our bang for our buck, where's our return on investment, we study for a limited number of years. The grandchildren of the original cohort mothers that were in this study are still being followed, and those grandchildren, compared to the control, this was a randomized control trial children, have stronger health outcomes. These are grandchildren that never met with the nurse home visitor, never met with a social worker, never was involved in services, the grandchildren of the children born to the mothers who were enrolled in the 70s and 80s in these programs. So that to me is where I get sort of the warm tinglies when I think the multi-generational impacts when we begin in pregnancy and very early childhood because we shift the life course trajectory for these infants and toddlers who themselves someday grow up to be adult contributing members of our societies and are more likely to have gainful employment to have robust, healthy relationships, to have stable housing, and to be situated economically and socially to better parent their own children um, down the road who, who never were in the services themselves, right? These, these grandbabies were not served by any support programs, but are still benefiting from the services their grandmothers engaged in decades ago. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. This issue is so near and dear to my heart and you know, I was just commenting to the chair before we started this afternoon that I have to pick my kid up from childcare by five. <laughs> so, um, you know, these, these things are real. They're, they're real to me too. They're real to us, you know, um, who, who've had kids and our grandkids to pick them up after school too. Um, and I'm, I'm just really pleased that we are able to have this particular work session because as I noted, when the request went in, we rarely get like an out of cycle list of recommendations from a group like this and um, is very thoughtful um, and things that I wish we as a county could do more for. And, I, and it sounds like we can actually dig into each of these four recommendations more. Um, my little girl, too, used the vending machine at her school <laughs> not that long ago. She earned a coin for, you know, being a good girl in school and was able to put it in and brought home a book. And they remember those things. Um, I didn't have those when I was younger. We didn't have, you know, the little, um, my little bookstore on the corner of neighborhood streets. Um, and so, in. In addition to that, my child was at the age where she was supposed to be learning how to read when COVID hit. So this is ex just really poignant at the, at, in the aftermath of COVID because there's several years of students all over the United States that really fell. Exactly. We're not able to learn how to read and they're two years behind, if not a little bit more, as you said in the accumulation of, of the backlog of reading. I absolutely 100% hear, 
hands down support all four of these recommendations. I guess what I would ask is how can we dig in more to each one of these? Um, is that the purview of this group of, of this volunteer committee if we if we could ask okay what are the tangible things we could do as a county to to support child tax credits what what could we do for early learning facilities universal pre-k um you know supporting a relief nursery in florence or south lane um what can we tangibly do now and move forward uh, knowing that this is such a huge issue for not only the kids but for the families especially women who are pulled out of the workforce during covid and have yet to been able to really get back into the the workforce full time as they were pre-covid and what burden that's putting on economic development within our society. Um, I would really like to hear some more ideas of, you know, first with my colleagues, if there's support for asking to go dig a little deeper in each of these four suggestions, um, but where would we sit this? Who would be able to work on this? I know you're volunteers. And you only have so much time in the day. And thank you so much for being willing to volunteer in this. But is that enough? I mean, is, is, are there any more tangible ideas in which we can move this forward? Do you mind if I start and then I'll pass it down the line because I think everybody's going to have a lot of really like important things to say about this. I will try to limit myself and keep it short, you guys. This is we're obviously so passionate about this that we all want to talk for a very long time. Um, I think. The thing, you know, if you're thinking about like how do we start making active moves to address these issues, it's policy, it's budgetary support, and it's programmatic support, right? These are kind of the avenues that we can approach this issue through. And we tried to kind of give a little bit of a mix on that. Um, very much, I mean, as you've heard already, we have a lot of really strong programming here in this county, United Way, Health and Human Services, the work that Chelsea and her team are doing. The programs are very strong and an important piece of that is to ensure that they continue to get funded and that the budgetary support is there for them. A lot of the programs they're doing, and I don't want to steal your talking point, but it's, you know, they're matching, right? So we're getting matched federal funds for state funds. So this is really important because we already have this work in motion and to backslide would be incredibly tragic, right? Now, we don't want to go backwards. So I think in the programmatic end, we have a lot of activity, and it's already very strong, and it's already gold star. It just needs to be continually supported over time. At the policy level, I do think that there are things that we can do and that you as commissioners can kind of use your position and your leverage to push forward. So things like the child tax credit, that would be a statewide legislative policy to push through. Um, some of the child care policy or legislation that was sitting for this session is there. So being able to use your position to advance legislation, I think, could be incredibly powerful move and also to explore additional legislation. A lot of states are doing very innovative things. You know, Maryland is actually an interesting state because they tend to do a lot of innovative things, Colorado, other places like that. So getting together the folks who are really uh, know policy and are able to draft policy or push policy forward is a powerful move. Aside from that, again, it's budget, right? How are we allocating the budget? It's such a tricky thing. I do budgeting all the time. And, you know, you're, it's always a series of trade-offs, right? You're just continually looking for the balance and the trade-offs. And you've got a complex set of stakeholders and everybody's got their own kind of pet way to address a budget. But, you know, I was talking to an economist at the U of O yesterday. Um, we were just having a general conversation, but one of the things that we were talking about was this ACES work, and his specialty is in SNAP and in federal food um, support for children. And he was talking about, you know, working at the margin and understanding that change at the margin looks small, and it really just doesn't sound that great to say, you know, we made a 0.25% impact at the margin. But in reality, that's thousands of children that are impacted. So I think as we think about these programs and as we think about numbers, it's hard to kind of sell that as like, woo, big success, right? It's a little bit of a, a 
of a PR game sometimes with these programs, but we're, like making those changes at the margin, those are real lives of, impacted. So I will pass it down the line. Uh, Commissioner Buck, I would say keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> We come here with these recommendations. We're an advisory group of volunteers. We have no statutory ability to say do this or do that. But we can advocate, and you can advocate too, and that's what Sarah was referring to. So legislatures do listen to county governments <clears throat> and making sure that our voices are heard collectively, Lane County, in terms of things that can help our young families and our young children uh, would go a long way towards helping the problem. Learning more about it is always a good idea. To what extent do we have child care in this uh, county? And um, the statistics are horrid. What can we do about it? Then you could do some of the regulatory stuff that you have. And I'm not an expert on this, so please don't think that I am. Uh, but can we make it easier for child care facilities to open up to cut through the red tape? I mean, that's something you can do. And then the last thing I would say, and that was a great question, by the way, uh, it's, it's a uh, mantra of a teacher is be creative because teachers never have enough money to, to do what they want to do. And yet in, before, before me and every one of my daily encounters with 166 kids in high school were lots and lots of bright kids that didn't have the opportunities that I had. Okay, how can I make it happen so they can have some of the opportunities? And creativity goes a long way towards solving things when you don't have limitless money. So learn more, be creative, do what you're doing, advocate would be the four things I'd recommend. So I think one of the things that when I think about how do we dig in deeper, how do we better support the families of Lane Counties is really how much of these are around economic supports for families. And I know that's a topic near and dear to all of your hearts. And all of you I know have young children that have been important to you in some way, shape, or form in your life. And when you think about the challenges of supporting an infant or a toddler when they're struggling, when they're having big emotions, when they're having a hard day and tantruming, we want a parent, a grandparent, a community member that is well-regulated to respond to that child. That's what prevents ACEs, that they're well-regulated, they're calm, they're centered themselves. And now if you think about the situation where if you don't know where you're sleeping that night or you don't know how you're making that month's rent or mortgage or where you're getting your food or you just found out you're getting laid off for your job, it's really hard <laughs> to stay calm in the face of a tantruming toddler, right? That's when sometimes adults make decisions that they regret where they, they come a little unhinged, they say something, they do something that they regret. So anything we can do to lessen the stress of families raising children in our community prevents ACEs. And for many, many, many families in our community, that's everything we're doing to better economically support family. And so it's it's a whole web of things that fit in this bucket around economic supports, work around housing, all ties directly to ACEs, work around job skills training and employment programs tied to ACEs, the regulatory work around making sure that it's easier for child care agencies to open up, to stay stable, and to stay functioning. We lost so many of them during COVID. And how do we help those business owners who stepped away off Often, as you highlighted, to care for their own families, to re-enter the workforce and resume their businesses. All of that contributes because when we are less stressed adults, that's how we're preventing ACEs in the future. And we all know that when we are stressed about our own economic security as adults, we don't make the best decisions. And that's how we can prevent for children. I will just add that um, this obviously resonates a lot with what we spoke about this morning. And um, so it does have a lot of intersection with some of the economic development pieces that um, have come into play earlier. And uh, earlier, Eve and I were talking about some of the um, places where Health and Human Services is actually stepping in also in terms of um, economic development, in terms of the um, MA program that is being developed, um, also collaborating with Lane Community College and working in some of the workforce development pieces. So there's, because it is very complex, I think that there are a lot of places where work is happening where we can call out that that has an impact as well potentially on, on ACEs in our community. Um, but also in terms of 
when we're working with partners and in our advisory committees and with folks that are in, in education and working with the Early Learning Alliance, for example, um, as opportunities come up and as there are things in a community we think that um, they are supporting that we think would also be beneficial in um, mitigating ACEs in the community, we can certainly bring those forward and highlight those um, as, they, as they appear. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Buck. Have you written a book yet? <laughs> Get started. Not yet. I've, I've, written, I've written down several of your quotes. Now, if you don't quote yourself, I will. <laughs> so, Thank you, you Commissioner. Kind of <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I, I will state to the board, we have a 2.30 time certain a very packed agenda. So we'll move down the, uh, down the um, with more questions from the Board of Commissioners uh, with the Vice Chair Trigger, followed by School Board Member Commissioner Senega. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I, you all know I appreciate you, but it's... Uh, can never hear it enough. I get to spend time as this board's liaison to the public health advisory, so I get to dig in a little deeper um, than my colleagues on this. And so I will just stay focused on a couple things. And I'll start it by, since we're talking about early literacy and books, one of my favorite books to read out loud to my grandkids was the If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. <laughs> Because if you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to want a glass of milk to go with it. And then there's a whole, you know, and there's a whole spiraling, right? And you get the milk, and then they slop it on the table, and then you're going to need a rag to wipe up the milk, and you're going to need a straw to drink the milk. And, um, and it's just such a perfect example of, right, everything leads to something else, and it's all interconnected, and it's all compounding, and you need all the pieces to have a happy, successful milk and cookies experience. Um, but that is always what I hear when we talk about um, really any of our public health initiatives, but especially this work. Um, I really appreciate you pulling the four out for us to look at and identifying, you know, to really live with the state legislature. And had we been a little more out in front of, we maybe could have had more of a coordinated advocacy effort going. But it turns out maybe that wouldn't have helped because there's not a lot moving up there right now. Um, the fiscal piece, you know, where that where that is, maybe we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that. But I'm especially interested in. The universal pre-K, I know that's like a years-long initiative to sort of lay some groundwork, do some feasibility, but I see, you know, there's some elements of lane code, um, so the sooner we can start to lay the groundwork for the possibility for something like that, should the community level feasibility work surface that there is the will, we're, we're not caught um, on our heels. Um, I think that is really important, and I just think generally this kind of way of dividing the work into where does it sort of live and in what order we might attack it is gonna be really useful for us at the Public Health Advisory to dig deeper into with this report and identify some of those things. And then the last thing I will say is, you know, it's frustrating that the legislature isn't moving. It can be frustrating that there's other entities that we uh, don't have jurisdiction over, but one thing we do have jurisdiction over is our own organization, our own operations. So um, looking past the panel to our county administrator, thinking about are we doing everything we possibly can for our own workforce and their families when it comes to, I, I know we do around wages and benefits, but even within benefits, use of that uh, flexibility around um, paid and unpaid time off and certainly around childcare supports, I would love to see us find a path to really in a, in a coordinated fashion where we can keep track and benchmark success towards doing even better for our own workforce because we have total jurisdiction over that. Um, and the folks that work for us while we um, don't have a, a, you know, a low wage workforce the way many other sectors and industry do, our workforce has families and their families have families. And if we've learned nothing else from this panel, it's that the, the multiplier effect is real and the intergenerational effect is real. So I would love for us to at some future point talk from an ACES perspective about what we're doing within our own organization. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Earlier in this current administration, they proposed Build Back Better and Universal Preschool was in there, and I, I was pretty excited. And it got axed, uh, much the same as a lot of programs will not get, or a lot of bills will not be passed in this current state legislature. But to me, uh, your point about let's be ready, uh, I think it's a great idea. For example, let's say the federal government does coalesce and that universal pre-K is a really good idea for our country. Are we ready? Are we ready to apply for those grants? Are we ready to move forward with it? And all that kind of work can be thought about and planned in the event that it might happen. And even if it doesn't happen, I think just the effort of planning for that and being aware of what the issues are and what we possibly could do would, would be really beneficial. 
Thank you, Vice Chair. Trigger. Sorry, Thank do you, you mind if I add just really quickly, Commissioner Moore? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. One of the things that I have been kind of forming over time and talking to the PIAC about and talking to Jocelyn and other folks about is the ability of um, public health and the business community to interact more strongly and the way that the business community is a huge linchpin or foundation for supporting our families, right? As adults, we spend hopefully not more than 50% of our time at work, but sometimes more, right? It's So those supports are really important. And one of the things that businesses can do are actually provide on-site childcare or provide childcare vouchers or, or actually participate in the childcare issue. Onward Eugene and, and the Chamber of Commerce right now are actually addressing that. They have a, very, a special dedicated staff member to look at childcare and how businesses can help. So I just wanted to highlight that work. Thank you. And uh, as I mentioned, um, Commissioner Senega also serves currently on the Junction City School Board, a rural school board. I, form, I formerly served on a predominantly metro school board, but uh, Commissioner Senega, with your lens. So I understand rural. <laughs> um, I was just thinking w with, with both lenses on, pre-K is so important, and the more kids you can get into it, because a kid that's had pre-K and the good kindergarten, they almost get the brakes put on them when they get into first grade as everybody else is catching up. Um, so the more you get this pre-K kind of school taken care of, um, I, think, I think everything just bumps up a year, really. Uh, so it is very important. Um, you mentioned Relief Nursery in Florence. Are you, are you working with Bob Teeter over there, or who are you working with? No, I was speaking with the program manager here at the Oh. So Eugene based um, and her name is in this report and now I'm going to forget it since I'm on the spot. I apologize to everyone no, involved in that, um, but I haven't been talking to anyone specifically out in Florence about that, mostly just through the Relief Nursery and then um, folks who are on the PHAC that have expressed concerns about how things are going in Florence. Gotcha. Okay, well, I mean, we can we can finish up offline, but uh, they do have they do have a, a sort of one going on out there. Um, and it's it's to help a lot of single mothers and stuff that are going to school or going to work and um, but it could always be expanded on Florence is big almost twenty thousand people in city limits and outside so um, yeah I think we're good okay right we're, we may have time for a couple of second round questions because I'm I'm going to be fairly brief um, and uh, um, Mr. Calander, you talked about how many things you could have brought in front of us, and we could have talked eloquently about all of those things. 15, 15 is not the right number. It's more like 20 to 25 things that we've talked about through the years, Dr. Warren, uh, that do really um, trigger adverse childhood experiences that really ripple throughout a child's life and the family's life around them. But you narrowed it down to uh, um, exposure to poverty and housing, uh, child care, Relief Nursery in Florence and Universal Pre-Care in Lane County. You know what Commissioner Senega said about kids having to having to slow down kids who have been in univer in in uh, Pre-K. Well, if it was Universal Pre-K, there's no slowing down, right? So that's a, a double benefit from a Universal Pre-K that would have all the kids entering school at the same level. You know what happens when you slow down kids that want to go go go? Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, they become classroom management issues, <laughs> which further disrupts education. <laughs> Well, you know, the, uh, um, you mentioned that uh, this uh, tags along with our CHIP a discussion that we had this morning, and the number one issue on the CHIP uh, is housing. And uh, really, if we look at adverse childhood experiences, so much of it is uh, related to substandard housing or no housing in many cases, and the associated poverty that, uh, that just engulfs like a, like, a, like a beast engulfs children. And, and really, you know, you see these kids, and, uh, and I mentioned that I was on the school, but I didn't get in classrooms. My wife spent a lot of time in classrooms, and you see the kids coming to school who don't have a stable living environment um, or whose parents are uh, stressed so much by their burdens of whether it be debt, whether it be the, uh, having to go to work and rush their kids off to child care. You know, so, you know, how do we, how do we get around that? And I, I kind of got on a horse this morning, and I talked about housing. And I'll, I'll ever so briefly, I'll, I'll touch on that. And what can we do as a board is we can do every single thing in our power to make sure that we have more housing available. The more housing that's available, the less the tendency is for it to elevate in price, whether it be rental or, or, uh, or um, ownership housing. So we need to do that. And ways that we can do that is by uh, um, 
discuss, but by next week we're going to be talking about um, about discretion that uh, that counties have in interpreting land use laws, for instance. And there's a broad range of discretion. It's uh, uh, how you interpret the land use laws. Well, maybe we can start looking at land use laws in a way that allows us to build more housing, not based upon what our our, our county has decided, but how does that look versus what other counties are doing? How can we get more housing started in Lane County, more kids in in, uh, in schools? Uh, excuse me, more kids in houses, uh, better kids in school. You know, Commissioner Trigger and I both spent uh, years sitting side by side at Food for Lane County, and we know that uh, out of every nine kids that get off a school bus, three of them are suffering from uh, from food insecurity. And along with food insecurity comes housing insecurity and all of the associated insecurities because if the kids are suffering from that, their parents are. And, and consequently, the parents are passing that stress along to their kids. There's nothing finer that we can do than to begin to relieve poverty and begin to get people into stable living environments. Um, and I'll, I could go on and on about that, but um, you know, I'm glad that you, you're limited to four things and we'll invite you back soon to go to the next four things, but, uh, but for now, um, what can we do about uh, exposure to poverty? We can, do, we can work on housing. What can we do about childcare? Well, one thing that a couple of us have talked about is Lane County. Could we provide childcare for Lane County at least, for Lane County employees? We used to. Uh, how do we get to yes on that? We've not even really begun that discussion, but if we can do it, then maybe it's something that can spread throughout the community and, uh, and get more people uh, involved in uh, and you know, actually, childcare close to where they work. What a wonderful thing! Uh, the relief nursery in Florence, of course. The, there's a relief nursery in Cottage Grove, a rural relief nursery. So you can look at that as a uh, as a model. Um, Florence is very different to Cottage Grove. Um, every every city in, in Lane County has very different characteristics. Florence has a uh, has a much higher income level, for instance. We saw on the map this morning than uh, than Cottage Grove. So you know, it's a very different type of uh, situation there. But uh, but you know. I, I'm only saying a few words about this and not inviting you to talk about it because you've, you've planted the seed among five commissioners right here, and I think you have uh, five sets of beers, five sets of eyes, and five hearts beating loud on this. And the uh, universal pre-K in, pre in Lane County, of course, we've talked about that, how that levels the field so that when kids do get into school. Now, I'll tell you, I picked up my first great grandson from Prairie Mountain um, on Thursday of last week, and they came and got in the car, and they had a bag. What's in the bag? Five bucks that uh, all the kids in, at Prairie Mountain in, in their class got uh, five bucks, and they got to pick their own books. And, uh, and um, of course, Yuali was reading you know, at three and a half years old uh, because it, <laughs> it has grandparents that read. And you would mentioned you know, having caring adults and caring grandparents that make a huge difference. So he had grandparents that read, so he picked chapter books. But you can imagine if you have a, a bunch of books for kids to pick, like a vending machine, you know, it's almost like a vending machine. You get to pick the books that you want. What a wonderful thing that is to take home for the summer. And, you know, five bucks don't last through the summer, but five bucks plant a seed that make kids want to read and make kids want to have their parents and their grandparents and other caring adults read to them. So there's a lot more to talk about here, and I'm going to ask for a second round with the Board of Commissioners before we get to our 2.30 times certain. But, Dr. Warren, thank you for assembling this panel, and thank you for uh, volunteering your work, and thank you for your eloquence. Thank you for talking to U of O, U of o economists about what we can do. And, uh, and, and thank you for your spare time. <laughs> you know, there's so much to do, and, and one hour to talk about it is just a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'll ask if there are any responses quickly and then look for a second round. So, Dr. Warren, to you. Well, I thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to bring our members of the subcommittee here and, and to discuss this issue. I, obviously, you know, this is a long-term problem. This is something we've been working on for almost a decade already, and certainly we'll continue to, to think about this. And, and, and le legislatively, we may not, you know, have had a lot of opportunity at this session, but, you know, it's a, this is a long game. So we are happy to start um, considering how we can put together sort of long-term plans to, um, to have a positive impact. So thank you for that. And we'll, we'll continue to bring those, those things forward as well. And, and Dr. Warren, and, and to the panel, beyond this podium here, so that we can take it out into the community, you know, we're talking about the business community and what, what is happening with the uh, Onward Eugene and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and businesses. What about the faith community, for instance? You know, the faith community cares deeply about kids, and I know a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, establishments, churches, synagogues, et, synagogues, et cetera, do provide um, pre-school pre for kids. I know our kids went to Bethesda Lutheran Preschool. 
So you know, it's, it's something that uh, if we can support everybody doing everything that they possibly can, then the, the burden is spread. So. You do bring up an excellent point when we were over the past two or three years that we've been working together on this. We kept on finding other groups that are doing things to help support this that we're unaware of. And uh, one thing that I think would really be beneficial would be somehow knit those groups together, some sort of clearinghouse, so we know what everybody else is doing. So we don't have a committee over here and a committee over here. And there's they're just an amazing number of people who are interested in this. But they're not very well connected. And there is an effort uh, in public health right now to, to do just that. It's, it's an ever-changing game, and groups come and go and so forth. And the COVID, COVID just blew away everything, as you know better than I. But uh, yeah, and I think you inadvertently may have given a shout out to United Way because United Way each year about this time does book fest and uh, delivers books and they raise money from communities and then they channel it to the kids and give books away. So that's another example of one of the great organizations that we have in Lane County that's working along similar lines and in the same vein that we're talking about. And I love your thought of knitting the fabric all together, so we're all pulling in the same direction. We'd have, a, if we could do that, we'd have the synergistic effect would have a whole lot more power than we have now. Yes, I, there is no question. We have the River Road Library, for instance, that uh, distributes books. Um, if we could have a universal, you know, book clearinghouse where everybody can draw from and, and return books, you know, I mean, books shouldn't sit on a library shelf gathering dust like a lot of kids' books in our shelf. I shelves. found out that uh, the books that go home in Crest Lane frequently get circulated among families in Crest Lane. Yeah. And we know that because we acknowledge our generous donors by putting a book sticker in every single book for two reasons, to acknowledge the groups and individuals that gave money for the books, and also so the kids can write their names in it so they have ownership of that book, which is something I learned when I was in medicine. But at any rate, now we know that those books just don't sit on bookshelves lots of times. They go to another family or to a cousin or to people in rural communities, as you know. They're, there's a whole lot of cousins. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And uh, we're up against the hour now. So Ms. McCrory, thank you very much for your- Do you mind if I make a closing remark? Please. Thank you so much. I promise this will be closing. But it, it is what you're saying, Commissioner Farr, is really important to think about, right? It is an ecosystem. And if all parts of the ecosystem are doing the thing that they can do, then we're gonna have some positive impacts. However, I think we risk relying too heavily on CBOs, too heavily on nonprofits, too heavily on volunteer organizations. And what those groups are doing are these little individual impact pieces often, mm -hmm. right? We do need to continue to address the economic development issues in this community. We need to continue to address housing. We need to continue to address substance abuse, right? Substance, subs, ex, exposure to substance abuse is an ACEs, it's, right? So thinking about the ability of the county and the larger government to impact those larger issues while the CBOs as part of a healthy ecosystem are taking on individual programs is a nice way to think about it. Thank you very much for that summation. Ms. McCurry, Mr. Kalanda, thank you for being here today. Chelsea, keep talking. Don't stop. <laughs> Dr. Warren, thank you for the panel today. Thanks, guys. Director thank Gray, thank you. you. Then uh, we'll uh, switch over to our 2.30 times certain. Give a moment for the panels to change. Hey, Rachel. And um, we'll be moving directly along. To, oh, excuse me. I will. Thank you. Oh, I'll adjourn. Thank you. I'll adjourn the meeting of the Board of County, the joint meeting of the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of Health and reconvene the uh, Board of County Commissioners. Welcome back to Harris Hall. You didn't know it, but you were gone for a while there. Now you're back. <laughs> so uh, um, we have a, uh, before us, um, this uh, uh, public works hearing order number hearing and order number twenty three zero six zero six zero seven in the matter of reviewing and approving the petition to form Pleasant Hill Goshen Rural Fire Department District to provide fire protection services to the proposed territory and setting a final public hearing, which date will come up with after a moment. Uh, so the uh, this is the first of at least two public hearings that we're going to have. Um, on the matter, and uh, we'll give an, inf an opportunity for people to enter information into the record, and it's also the time for oral and written statements to be presented in support or opposition for the request for an election to authorize a request for an election to authorize the formation of the fire protection district. 
written statements for or in opposition must clearly specify the de defect, error, irregularity, or omission, if any, and must be made in the manner required by ORS 198.705 to ORS 198.955. Any written statement not so made and filed shall be cons considered vo voluntarily waived. And let me, let me ask you this. Am I out of order right now? Am I jumping ahead, or am I spot on exactly correct? I would say you're on board. You're on point right now. Can you say that you're exactly correct? <laughs> you're exactly correct. Right on the mic. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that in months. Um, if the board approves the proposal, the second hearing will be limited to consider whether there is a sufficient request for an election on the formation. If there's no request for an election at a second hearing, the board, if so, mo if it so moves, can adopt a final order on the formation and the decision criteria for special district formations are established in Oregon Revised Statute Chapter 198 and Lane County Board Order Number 07-12-12-19 and are cited in the agenda cover, cover memo and attachment, which can be clicked on view items uh, on today's agenda on, on our website. So at this point, I'll call for dis, uh, commissioner ab abstentions due to conflicts or interests or conflicts of interest or biases. And I'll begin at my left, Commissioner Livall. No, sir, I don't. Commissioner Buck. I will just declare, and I'm not sure if this is a, uh, a conflict of interest or not, but for the record, I have been working with the group that is presenting this with the county in order to move forward. Um, and I will look to council to see if that is a conflict of interest or just for me noting it as a potential conflict of interest. I believe given your involvement, I think just noting it as a potential conflict of interest would be sufficient at this point. Thank you. And it seems consistent with your work as your county commissioner from that particular district. Yes. So perfect. Uh, Vice Chair Trigger. Uh, no conflict of interest or bias. Commissioner Seneca. No conflict of interest. And I have no conflict of interest or bias. So anybody challenge of what you've heard? I see no challenges. So at this point, um, Mr. Mokra Heisk, I'm going to ask you, as I usually do, to introduce your panel. Uh, so, so they can give the to follow that. Uh, <laughs> Say that again. It's tough to follow that, Jerfar. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, uh, the words coming out of my mouth came off of Rachel's typewriter. <laughs> Very good. And so uh, I will just say that the board has heard um, public testimony, and I think you're aware of a lot of work that has gone in by various departments in Lane County, including land management, our uh, legal office, assessment and taxation, the clerk's office, around two different uh, districts that are interested in forming uh, fire districts. So here you're hearing about one of them. Um, and uh, this is uh, Marcus Vehar from our county council is here to answer questions that you may have about the process. And of course, Rachel Serslov, um, senior planner in land management, I think is going to take the item and walk through this with the board. Then uh, my next line is, um, I, I think it's a typo. It says we will not hear the report from staff. I think it will should say we will now hear the report from staff. I did notice that typo. <laughs> um, so we will now hear the report from staff. Thank you, Chair Farr, and good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, for the record, Rachel Sarslow, staff planner for this application. And the request uh, before you today is for the formation of a special district, specifically a fire protection district. And these type of, types of requests are subject to Oregon Revised Statute Chapter 198 and Lane County Board Order 07-12-12-19, which provides local guidance for processing applications related to special districts. This is the first of two public hearings scheduled on this matter, and the second is proposed and tentatively scheduled for June 27, 2023. Specifically, the application before you today is for the formation of the Pleasant Hill Goshen Rural Fire Protection District. And currently, there are two separate districts that serve the area southeast of Eugene and south of Springfield. Um, those two separate districts are Pleasant Hill Fire District and Goshen Fire District. And they currently work in conjunction with each other through an intergovernmental agreement to serve that area. And so this request today is to dissolve those two separate districts and form a single district to serve that area. Um, the proposal also includes the addition of um, additional properties that are going to be added to the service area of the combined district. Um, notice was posted and published um, as required as of today. And I, uh, just a moment ago, handed out um, two letters of support that were submitted um, to the record just yesterday. So you have those before you. 
Uh, in the agenda cover memo, um, staff has evaluated the approval criteria in ORS 198 and found that all approval criteria are met. And if the board approves the formation request today, then a final hearing will be set for June 27, 2023. And the final hearing will be limited to considering whether there is a request for election on this matter. Uh, due to the presence of a permanent operating tax limit proposed for the district, an election should be held uh, after the final hearing is conducted on June 27th. And therefore, staff is recommending that the board adopt the order as written to approve the formation of the Pleasant Hill Goshen Rural Fire Protection District and set the final hearing for June 27, 2023. Uh, at 1.30 p.m. time certain. Thank you, Ms. Serslo. Thank you. Then uh, any further uh, staff presentation? Um, I'll actually add just one comment on top of that too. Um, the presence of the second hearing may seem a bit redundant um, as we are calling an election due to the fact that there is going to be a proposed tax rate. And so the statutes require that since there is going to be that tax rate present, there needs to be an election called either way. However, because of how the process needs to work, that second hearing is going to be where we would call the election officially and that needs to be held as part of the procedure of the process. And so while the purpose of the second hearing is usually to determine whether or not there will be enough uh, to call an election. Because of the proposed tax rate, there will be an election called either way. The second hearing will be more of a formality, of course, um, contingent on the uh, answer to this hearing today. Very good. Then uh, just a quick question. Will we be closing the public hearing and public record today, or will that extend to beyond the second hearing? It is up for the board to determine. You are able to continue this hearing if you decide you need additional time to review. Um, however, assuming you're satisfied, you are able to issue the order calling for the second hearing today, and we can close. Very good, then at this point I will open the public hearing. Um, I see that we have uh, three people signed up in person and um, Ms. Jones, can you tell me, is there anyone signed up online? We have one, I've, I'm seeing. Yes, Chair Farr, we do have one person signed up online. Very good, then I'll ask that you uh, limit your testimony to about three minutes, but we will be uh, fairly lenient in that if you have things to say, uh, this is the time to say them. So uh, for the public hearing today, we first have uh, uh, Paul F. Ilsa, now that name may have been crossed out. It was crossed out, okay. Then we have uh, Todd Anderson, who will be followed by Jake Shafan. I'm sorry, uh, step to the mic, uh, state your name, and at that point um, we'll run a three minute timer, but uh, we're once again lenient on that. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Todd Anderson. I am currently a board member and president of the Pleasant Hill Fire District and also a board member of the Pleasant Hill Goshen Fire Authority. So I'm here to speak in support of the consolidation merger forming of the new district. Um, this is something that has been being worked on for the last 10 years. It was started by previous boards before us. It's been a long process to get to the point where we are now, um, but we think it's time that was well, well worth it to get to this point. So forming this new district for us uh, and consolidating uh, our resources will be a benefit to the community. Um, currently what we have is the two districts working together under an IGA and we wanna formalize that so we're working under one umbrella so that we can share all resources, um, equipment, staff, everything in that manner. With this, um, consolidation that we're, we're looking to do. Um, it will create 24 hour staffing at two stations. So not only will we have 24 hour staffing at the Goshen station, but we would have 24 hour staffing at the proposed new Pleasant Hill station. And so what that would do is um, allow much better service to both communities, have um, overlapping calls that will be handled in a much um, more expedient way um, and overall um, give the taxpayers of the community a, a better, better district. Um, with that, um, this proposal would allow us to construct a new station in Pleasant Hill. We would demolish the existing one. New station would be built there, a very modest station, but one that could house people 24 hours a day. Uh, not only paid staff, but volunteer residents that we could have on site. Um, so we can utilize their services, but not have the, the higher expenditures of uh, complete full staff. Um, it would also allow us to um, 
do the required maintenance and replacement of critical investments, um, such as our facilities, the Goshen Station. We have a small station in Jasper um, and the station in Pleasant Hill that would be, be um, built. Uh, it would uh, give us uh, dedicated staff to manage critical organizational areas, including training, recruitment, and retention, and health and wellness. Um, and it would just o overall improve what the district provides now. We're currently almost um, addressing 1,200 calls a year. We're getting very close to that between the two districts. And so um, our districts are very busy. Um, as, as it was said, it does require a rate increase. We would be raising our uh, rates to $2.20 uh, is what our proposed rate would be. Um, it would double the Pleasant Hill District's rate. We're at $1.10, have been there for many, many years. Um, I believe we're the lowest or close to the lowest in the county as far as the rate goes. And it would modestly raise Goshen's rate. Um, you've received a letter from both boards of the Goshen and Pleasant Hill um, that we fully support this. And um, we would very much ask of your approval of this and your future support should you approve this. So, Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And uh, Mr. Vidra, I'm going to step back one step. Is there testimony from the applicant that I should have entertained previously or? Uh... Um, I believe that he, Chief Smith is able, or is able DP here. I believe it was on the script that he could give testimony. I'm not confirmed that he is. Hey, very good. Do we know? If he is. He's here. Yeah. I, he has, didn't confirm with me that he would be here. He's right back here. Okay. He's waving. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see how often we met in person? <laughs> You're certainly welcome to step to the mic and uh, provide testimony if you wish to. If you would state your name and, uh, and your uh, affiliation. And you have, uh, what do we say, 35 minutes? No. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, Board of Commissioners. I am Andrew Smith. I'm the fire chief for Pleasant Hill Goshen Fire and Rescue. I did not necessarily actually intend to speak, but... Um, I would appreciate the opportunity. Um, I would not consider myself the applicant. However, I would represent the applicant. The, the uh, applicants in this matter are the chief petitioners or members of our board and committed members of our community. I am the fire chief that runs the existing organization. You might not realize this by looking at me, but I am not a product of the 60s. Our two fire districts, however, are. And I don't mean that as a detriment. But what was created in the 60s was built on a concept of fire districts being supported by volunteer members who responded to their emergencies in their neighboring um, homes and communities. That service was predicated on a small number of calls, monthly or annually, depending on how you look at it. We would have board members that would tell you that once upon a time, they were volunteers as well. And during that time, our fire districts ran less than 100 calls per year. We did that in the month of May. Our fire district is changing, our demand is changing, and the threat in our community is changing. This effort to form a new fire district is the most realistic effort to encompass all of our challenges in one solution that really we can stand behind for our voters, which addresses both capital and staffing challenges, as well as deployment challenges in the community. You probably understand this, it's not getting any better. You'll hear from a citizen here in a few minutes that lives in our community, and you'll find out that there's actually homes in our community between the city of Eugene and where we serve that don't have fire protection, which is a, a matter that I would consider a basic human need living in an area like this. And that's sad to me, because that also serves as a threat to our very community, to the city of Eugene, to the Lane Community College, et cetera. So it's simple for me. I've helped work many hours with the board of directors to try to create a solution that I believe supports our service long-term, supports our community, and lays a foundation for what will be bigger efforts to come down the road as fire districts have no choice but to band together because our work is getting harder and the nature of our deployment is having to change. We're having to move from um, almost 100% volunteer staffing models to much more career staffing and other things. So I would urge you in hopes that you move this forward and move it to our community so that they have a vote in this matter and uh, join with all of us that represent supporting this. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. Can you spell your last name, please? Yeah, Smith. It's S-M-I-T-H. Just not Y, not to, okay, great. Nope. And that's Andy Smith. Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, 
For public testimony is uh, Jake Shafan, and please help me with the pronunciation. Uh, thank you. R E N, thank you. You'll have to forgive me, I wrote something out. It's easier for me to uh, read than just speak. Um, so, first and foremost, thanks for the opportunity um, to speak and talk about the fire district and offer commentary. So, our current residence is within city limits, um, though we recently purchased a piece of land which is on Furland Boulevard, right outside of city limits, which is just above Lane Community College. Um, as an Oregonian, as a resident of this community and as a homeowner, I categorically and fundamentally support the formation of the new fire district, full stop. I don't think I need to educate anyone in this room about the dangers nor the realities of wildfire. And every year it seems to get just a little bit closer to home. It's pretty damn terrifying. How many of us have had our life belongings packed in boxes ready to evacuate at moment's notice in the past five years? That's really, really, really scary. And when you drive down 126 and go through the Mackenzie River corridor and you look at the chimneys and the stonework of what's left, it's devastating. Like, it'll bring you to tears and it's just absolutely visceral. I can't possibly imagine being one of those homeowners and I hope that I never experience that and I hope that anyone in this room never has to experience that either. Now, imagine being one of those homeowners, one of those human beings, calling 911 and being told and being asked, excuse me, is anyone's life in imminent danger? No, we're not coming. That's the reality right now. And so that's quite literally happening less than five miles away from this room. Like, let that sink in for a moment. Less than a 10 minute drive, we can watch the whole hillside go up in flames and no one's coming, in theory. How could that possibly be? Well, it's because there's pockets of residencies that are not fire protected, not by Pleasant Hill Goshen nor by Eugene Springfield. And it's by no fault of their own, but rather by arbitrary lines that I guess were drawn back in the 60s. And so the harsh reality is that the land that we purchased, it's not fire protected. It sits in no man's land along with a lot of other residences. And for the most part, I don't think our community knows this is actually happening. Excuse me. Um, so there are literally homes and families with children whose house would go up in flames. They could call 911 and say, sorry, no one's coming. Do I think that would react realistically happen? No, like I have full confidence a local fire district would come out, but they don't have to. So we've been fortunate enough to work with Andrew and the board and we have a one-off contract in place. So we technically now our fire protected, but that's a one-off contract amongst a lot of residences. We have immediate neighbors who aren't fire protected. And there's a lot of people up there who don't know this is happening. Is it really sustainable nor advantageous to have all of these residences that don't have fire protection? Absolutely not. So in closing, you could say what you will about local politics, about bureaucracy, about process, but we all need to accept that wildfires are real. They're not going away. We have to live with them year after year. By voting against the formation of this new fire district, it's a gross disservice to our community and to our fellow human beings. So to repeat and underscore, we absolutely support the efforts to support a new fire district. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the firefighters. And if year after year, we're gonna say thank you firefighters, let our actions be just those and not, and not just words. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sheffron. And Ms. Jones, I'll ask you to, can you manage the uh, online queue, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Farr. At this time, we have one person signed up for public comment, um, Anne-Marie Levis. Anne-Marie, I will unmute your microphone. And would you like to be on camera? Sure. Okay, one moment, I will change you and I'll promote you to a panelist and you'll have a button to unmute your camera and we'll be able to see you. Chair Farr, you. Uh, Administrator Moker Heisey, thank you for hearing all of our testimony today. Uh, my name is Anne Marie Levis. I'm a owner of a small business in Eugene. I do work for organizations like this, and I am working with the Pleasant Hill and the Ocean Fire Districts to get out the word about this petition and be able to explain this complex issue. But today I'm here on my own time as a resident of Lane County, just outside the city inside the Goshen Fire District. I very much thank the Board of County Commissioners for hearing this petition today. I'm very supportive. Our area needs 
better fire service, but we also need our public agencies to do more with us. I know this is not news to any of the five commissioners today. This is really at the heart of what this petition is. These two fire districts under uh, that have been working diligently to cut costs, to do more, but they've really run out of ability. They've done a lot of good thinking, good work in the community, gather signatures, bring this petition forward. And I hope that the Board of County Commissioners will move forward with this. We all know what it takes to have a levy that comes up every five years for ongoing services. What I very much appreciate about this petition going forward is it sets a fixed tax rate. Yes, it will raise taxes, but it also will be reasonable about this and ensure that this services will go on forever. And as all of you know, our fire services are so critical in the city. Um, I ask that the board support allowing this to go to the voters so the voters can decide whether to raise on taxes. But you've heard enumerate all of the things that will come out of this. This is a modest package um, going to the voters, and I'm going to work very hard as a uh, independent volunteer to help get the word out about this. And I thank the Board of County Commission during all of this. Thank you for your public comments. <clears throat> Is that the uh, conclusion of online testimony, Ms. Jones? Recording in progress. Thank you. Then uh, I'll look around Harris Hall and see if, ask if anyone else wishes to provide testimony to the Board of Commissioners on uh, this public, during this public hearing. I'm seeing none and no um, testimony in opposition as of this point. So then uh, any additional comments from staff? I have no additional comments. No. Uh, questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? Okay, this is going well so far. At this point, then, I will close the public hearing and close the record. And uh, we have a couple of options to the staff. Um, and uh, Commissioner Buck, I will let you choose the option. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. It's my pleasure to ask to the board to move to adopt uh, order 23-06-06-07 to approve the petition for formation of the Pleasant Hill Goshen Rural Fire Protection District and to set a final public hearing date for June 27th, 2023 at time certain. A second. <laughs> Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Buck and seconded by Vice Chair Trigger. That is order 23060607 uh, with the uh, setting of a, of a second and final public hearing. Uh, discussion to the motion. I'm seeing no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you on June, June 27th. Yes, June 27th. Thank you. Thank you. Recording in progress. It's about time. <laughs> Okay, then we'll move down the agenda and uh, we're on item 12B, which is the first reading and setting the second reading and public hearing on ordinance, tw ordinance 2304 in the matter of amending the land management division's program, for fee, program fee schedule effective July 1st, 2023 and adopting an emergency clause. And uh, Mr. Mokar, I see I will ask you to introduce Keir. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> Our uh, land management division manager is here. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Farr, and good afternoon, Commissioners. This is just a really straightforward first reading, uh, setting a second reading in public hearing for later this month. Um, this is uh, the item before you is a proposed fee adjustment to the Land Management Division's building program fee schedule. This item has already been reviewed and approved by the Finance and Audit Committee. Um, per state um, statutes, the increase in building permit fees needs to be reviewed through a public hearing and adopted by ordinance um, by the board. And this first reading sets that uh, process in motion. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Any questions? 
I'm seeing none. I'll, I remind folks that our Finance and Audit Committee consists of Commissioner Buck and uh, Auditor um, Vusik Schaefer and myself as the three members of that uh, Finance and Audit Committee. So uh, with no questions, um, do I have a motion? Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. I'll move approval of the first reading and set in setting the second reading and public hearing for Ordinance 23-04 in the matter of amending Land Management Division's building program fee schedule effectively uh, July 1st, 2023 and adopting an emergency clause. Second reading and public hearing to be June 27th, 2023 at 1.30 time certain. I'll second that. Thank you. Moved by uh, Commissioner Buck and seconded by Commissioner Lovell. Um, Ordinance 23-04, first reading and setting the second reading. Discussion to the motion. I'm seeing none. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you for making the trip, Kier. Yep. <laughs> See you soon. Then um, we'll move along to item 13A, which is a report um, under Health and Human Services heading, uh, a report on the Stabilization Center project update and discussion. And Mr. Mokra Heisky, I will ask you to introduce, reintroduce, Yet again, Director Gray. Director Gray, will you introduce your panel, please? Yes, I would be happy to introduce the panel. I'm going to move this. <laughs> uh, so we are here to discuss the Lane County Stabilization Center, and uh, here with Dr. Pauline Gishohi, our Behavioral Health Division Manager, David Ward from Facilities, and Brittany Deliso, who is our Project Manager for the Stabilization Center. And uh, very uh, glad to bring an update update to you. We have not uh, done a formal update to this board. The last update that we did was uh, with the board prior to the start of the new year. So uh, we will be discussing a number of items related to um, the operational uh, facility the operations of the facility, the capital construction of the facility, some of the decision points that we're having to make based on various uh, particularly financial barriers that we are uh, encountering. Um, but before we get into all of that detail, uh, Dr. Gishohi he will take a moment to also talk a little bit more about the behavioral health system within Lane County. I know that uh, we all feel a tremendous sense of urgency around getting the stabilization center up and running. And we wanna also make sure that we're speaking to the systems that we are supporting today, and particularly the areas of, um, of most rapid growth, which are in the behavioral health residential housing and mobile crisis spaces. So Dr. Gishohi will, will cover that as a broad uh, systems piece, and then we'll dive into the details with uh, Brittany taking the lead on the stabilization center portion of the presentation. Thank you, Eve. So we felt it may be grounding for us to think of uh, the system and kind of where the stabilization center falls in the system, just to kind of help us uh, see the kind of how where the, the stabilization center fits in the system and where we see the gaps uh, currently. And also to kind of address the urgency that is currently in our community and the perception that we may not be doing enough. I, I, I know there is more that needs to happen, but at the same time grounding uh, all of us in what is cur already currently happening and what we are trying to do to build a uh, better system that we are all looking forward to. So, and I know you've had this information before, so I'll be very brief. I, sh I shared some of these when I presented the budget just a few weeks ago. So it's just a little grounding to kind of uh, put the, all this in perspective. So uh, Lane County Behavioral Health falls under the, uh, the county mental health uh, program uh, designation. So that is the delegated authority that the state has uh, uh, granted to us as the local entity that oversees the behavioral health uh, um, system locally. So within that system, we have uh, services that we provide in internally as the county, as, as behavioral health, and we ha also have services that we subcontract with the larger system or with the larger behavioral health providers to, uh, to 
uh, make sure that the, the array of services within that com continued continuum is, uh, is, is provided. So I'll go through a few of those, the internal and external, and then we'll jump into the, uh, the specific crisis stabilization center and where it, it fits in in that continuum. So for the internal services, the, the services that we provide in-house, again, just a, a recap, we have the adult outpatient services where we do individual therapy, group therapy, case management, peer support, and medication management. We are serving anywhere from 1,800 to 2,000 adult unique individuals a year. Uh, so those are folks who are seeing in, in the clinic in an outpatient setting. We also have our child program that also provide the same type of services, services to both uh, the, the children, the, the kids themselves, and the larger family system. We we're listening to the ACES uh, presentation before. So that also, when we are serving children in our clinic, we are serving the entire fam family as well. So it's mental health assessment, screening for both the kids and the family, psychiatric evals, medication uh, uh, assess, uh, medication management, peer support, and again, a lot of case management and care coordination in conjunction with the school system. And we also have our lane uh, treatment center that is our methadone program and uh, buprenorphine program that addresses the opiate crisis in our community. We just expanded that and still have a lot of demand for those services. We, so we are looking at uh, uh, expanding those once we have a medical director and uh, vacancy, when we feel vacancies that we have, we still currently have in that program. And under this, the CMHB, we also have lane care, which are teams that are embedded with this two CCOs. And what they do is case management and care coordination for the, the, the uh, members that are enrolled with it within the two CCOs. So we have two separate teams, Pacific Source team and the Trillium team that do that work on behalf of the CCOs. And then that leaves the ever-growing uh, population that is the forensic population in our clinic. And uh, a lot of the, the services that we provide uh, for those folks that are in that intersection between behavioral health, crim criminal justice, and often are unhoused. So again, we are doing similar uh, services. We do case management, medication management. Uh, we do forensic ev evaluations. We do screenings at the jail. Uh, we do work with parole, probation, so anybody th that is fitting the uh, criteria for that intersection. And we are also doing civil commitment investigations and uh, uh, referrals. We also do uh, support the psychiatric review board, so those are folks who are and, uh, gu guilty except for insanity, but stable enough to uh, live in the community, so we are providing some oversight there. We also do adult protective services. So these are folks that are uh, doing investigations for any suspected abuse uh, of, of, of populations that we serve. And within that system, we are also overseeing adult foster home and the residential uh, service uh, providers. So it's a, that continuum. So we provide alongside the state. The state does the licensing and we have the oversight to make sure that the program, uh, the program providers are providing those services within the, the, the statutes and the guidelines from the state. So the, all those are the services provided in-house. So then uh, we uh, collaborate and partner with uh, a lot of our other, non, usually nonprofit providers that are uh, doing uh, you know, that, that, uh, that continuum. So we do the, I would say, a lot of the intense services on site, so the, the, so the screening, the psychiatric evals, and then the other uh, services, auxiliary services are provided in the community. So we do uh, have residential services, as I mentioned, the, those that are specific to the aid and assist population. 
We have a, a, a civil commitment type residential facilities, and those are all different levels of care. So we have secure residential, which is the highest level, all the way to supported housing, which is the lowest level. So we have that array of residential uh, 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 levels that are providing services for us. We have, uh, uh, we subcontract for detox because that's a service that's specialized that we can't do at our clinic. So we have detox services. We have other substance abuse providers that, that help do this work. We do have uh, um, guardianship services that we are subcontracting for to support people who are not able to make decisions on up, uh, for themselves. So they have a guardian that is appointed through the code. So it's a, it's a legal process that pro, uh, assigns somebody to make decisions for some of our folks who are not make, able to make decisions for themselves. And we also provide indigent supports for, for people who are underinsured or uninsured or who are, could, cannot get uh, insurance. So we have funding through the, the state for indigent. And uh, we also have pharmacy and a lab at our clinic. So anybody that uh, uh, is in our system or in, within our services that are, is needing lab and pharmacy support, we can do that from uh, the clinic. And we also have supported employment that we subcontract with a few of our providers. So it's quite extensive. So I wanted to kind of just ground us into already existing services that we are providing and to also call out that we are in a crisis. So oftentimes people don't necessarily see what's happening, they are, all, are almost all fo focused on what is missing. And yes, there is quite a few that's missing, and we'll be talking about one of those gaps, which we have uh, presented before, and we'll be uh, providing some additional updates. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brittany. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you so much for the time today. Um, I have yet to master the right contrast on the slides for presentations. I'm so sorry if you can't read this, but this intent, um, the intent of this, this graphic is really to paint the picture of a lot of what Pauline just described and where the stabilization center might fit. Um, so these are current uh, access points to crisis services within Lane County. Um, and I won't call out every individual provider that's listed, but many of those were on the previous slide are the services and programs that were subcontracted with and that we're helping to fund to ensure that those that service continuum is provided. Um, but you'll see mobile crisis, crisis call lines, and that does include 988, but there are many local existing crisis lines here, some specific to populations such as you youth um, or substance use services and those in recovery. Uh, Walk-in services, including peer services and also Hourglass, our current community crisis center. Um, and then we have detox listed there as it's a, a walk-in is how you may access that. Um, and then to call out, we have incarceration listed as a point of access for um, crisis services in Lane County. Um, and I would argue that that's problematic to include that on this graphic, but it's our current reality. Um, and, and also to call out as we are um, intending to close gaps and um, ensure a more comprehensive uh, system, we do want to maintain what we currently have, just that it would be rightly used. So certainly there's still a, a a role and a place for folks to um, be held in custody, but in the right setting and the right um, purpose and not as a form of crisis intervention and behavioral health treatment. Um, and the hospital emergency rooms and then that 24 seven care is where we have placed the, where the stabilization center would fit um, in providing ongoing access, immediate access that can be sustained over multiple days as folks need it. Um, and then also understanding kind of where it's, it sits from a process perspective. Um, so this is a slide that I use out in the community quite often as I help to try to paint the picture of how we are envisioning this resource to fit within our existing system on a broader level. So we're all probably quite familiar with the blue line at the top um, and that this is a course of action that could take place that when a crisis occurs, someone may call 911, first responders may be called to the scene 
seen. If it cannot be resolved there, they may be transported to the emergency room um, and assuming they get stabilized, hopefully connected with ongoing care and looking at the blue line as, as a medical related crisis, possibly. Um, so thinking about below, looking at how that could be mirrored for a behavioral health related crisis, not that it would have to happen this way, but it could, that somebody could call 988 or one of those existing crisis lines that we have. Um, and it's clear that a community response is warranted and so mobile crisis could be dispatched. Currently not how mobile crisis is dispatched, does not happen through the crisis lines in 988 to call that out, um, but that kind of trajectory. And then if mobile crisis um, is on the scene and sees that somebody needs more intensive support, they could be transported to the stabilization center rather than the emergency department, um, stabilized and connected with ongoing behavioral health care. So this is a possible way that this could fit kind of in a context we're all familiar with. And I do have a little gray arrow from first responders to the stabilization center, recognizing they may be the ones responding even to a call that comes into 988 or a crisis line. And then the last thing um, is just to kind of bring us up to speed. So wanted to introduce this uh, report by kind of grounding us in the work we've been doing, but this is a really deep dive into where we've been since we've seen you last. Um, so since October, some of the work we've done, and this is listed out in the board packet as well in the bullet points, um, but some things that we wanted to highlight, and I'll actually use my notes for this because I don't want to get this wrong. Um, but recognizing um, last we spoke, we talked about uh, a site location and looking at um, the property on MLK across from Watson Stadium and next to MLK Commons. And so um, we have since moved forward in working with uh, an architecture firm called Clark Jose, who specialize in working on medical facilities, not as our contracted um, architect designers. We're not quite to that stage yet, but we really wanted a more refined estimate of the cost associated with the build if the build were to um, fully meet requirements for what our program expects and also what the state requires. Um, so we've been partnering with Clark Jose and we will spend the bulk of the rest of our time sharing about what we learned from them. But that's a lot of the work we've been doing since we saw you last. Um, also have worked internally to get a better idea of the operational cost and how we could estimate that looking out for the next or for five years from the day that the facility would open um, and what we do know of, of billing and other mechanisms that could sustain this work. And then there's a lot of knowledge gaps because this is innovative work. So we're trying to understand um, how to close those and address what remains as an operational funding gap that we will also get to in a moment. Um, other things to call out, continued funding efforts to try to recruit additional funds. Um, something maybe that I'm the most excited about is that we were selected internally at the county um, as one of the pilot projects to run through the Lane County Equity Lens. So we've been partnering really closely with the county equity manager um, to ensure that that lens is really coloring the work that we do from building design to community engagement and beyond. Um, and speaking of community engagement, a lot of what we have spent some time and effort on is listening to our community and providing platforms to do so. And that has um, paved the way for kind of our current effort, which is to launch a survey that has really pinpointed questions included um, to invite input that can actually be reflected in the decision making of the project. So worked with some internal experts around how to craft survey questions, how to write it in an accessible manner but the goal is asking um, concrete questions that folks can then advise how this program will look and function so that it's meaningful um, to our own residents here in the community. So that launched yesterday um, and we'll have a couple months and excited to bring forward some results from that work. Um, and then lastly, kind of centering or circling back to the funding effort, we did gather a group of local funders um, earlier in May to talk about what uh, community investment might look like. And I know that we've had some conversations with the Oregon Health Authority who are really looking to see um, how this could be funded by communities. Um, and so we pulled together um, local CCOs, hospitals, um, cities, chambers, foundations, anyone and everyone, really just to hear a presentation of a lot of the content that you'll hear today of the anticipated cost and the why, um, and then to set the stage for follow-up meetings that we have then been having in a one-on-one -on -one setting to really understand how each entity might contribute and play a role in making this happen. 
So all of that's loosely reflected on that timeline um, with some colors there, but that's the work that we've been up to. Um, so Eve mentioned at the beginning that we did one item we wanted to bring to you was talking about recruiting a provider or providers for this program. And I uh, wanted to explain a little bit of our hopes for this um, approach, the approach that we're taking. We're looking to bring on um, possibly two providers, one for youth and one for adults, or we'd certainly be open to a single provider that could tackle it all. So we're holding some flexibility there, but we're asking two primary tasks. One would be to bring them on for pre-service delivery, to join in and a part of the planning. Um, the project management elements of this work have that those providers would then be the providers providing the services too. Um, but the second piece, the second task that we'd be recruiting a provider for um, in operating the program is contingent upon funding. So we're spelling that out in the RFP as well. Um, and then I have a carve out on that box on the right, which is just to say the idea of, of presenting this with the open option to have possibly two different types of providers, adult and youth, is that is if there were a provider that was more poised and ready to take on one um, element of the program, we could move more nimbly and possibly open one section of the progression of the program sooner based on provider response and availability. So we're trying to position ourselves to quickly engage and act on what might be there rather than starting with a really big ask that may not be satisfied quickly. Um, so just trying to, to be nimble in that way. Um, so the other big kind of ticket item we wanted to bring to you all are the results from the work with Clark Jost, and I will have David start us off with that. Thank you, commissioners. So um, I'll provide a little bit of a segue into the next section. Um, you know, the last uh, charge, I guess, was to provide some due diligence moving forward as far as the, um, you know, one, particularly trying to refine a site selection. Um, there had been a lot of work. Um, done, I think, over the last year, maybe in addition to that, on several sites here locally and trying to determine, you know, which site might be the best suited for this type of a facility in our county. Um, just want to reiterate the importance of, of sort of these three factors. So site selection has been a big part of our effort. <clears throat> Second, um, on, a, on sort of the, the most uh, probable site, we wanted to make sure to perform a real high-level environmental study. So we want to make sure that, that any site that we're looking at doesn't have any, um, you know, legacy uh, hazardous materials type issues or, you know, some sort of a toxic dump that we just didn't know about. So we had a local uh, environmental uh, consultant to actually perform a very, um, you know, a high level but very detailed site assessment and we found no issues on this particular site. So that was real promising. And then third, um, by working with a consultant, again, providing a high-level um, estimate of probable cost for this facility, uh, ensures that we have a clear budget estimate for the process and that really more importantly, that uh, we're able to establish a budget that really aligns with the program requirements. And um, those program requirements include uh, some licensure requirements, state requirements, and um, those are the project teams. So we know what, what the program, you know, what, what kind of the direction that we want to take the program, how do we make sure that we establish a budget that's appropriate to support all those levels? And so that's why we specifically chose uh, Clark Jose as our primary consultant for this high level estimate only. As Brittany said, this is not, um, we haven't put out an RFP yet, but we want to make sure before that, that we really laid the groundwork um, for this and that we're ensuring we aren't making incorrect assumptions along the way. So a high level cost estimate at this point really provides an informed decision about our project scope and helps also inform the timeline of the project. You know, what are, what are the realistic durations during this entire process? Um, because you know, once somebody sees a picture or a certain number, you get that stuck in your head and then all of a sudden that starts managing the expectations. So we, again, we want to be realistic about, about specific about budget and the timeline of the overall project. 
Yeah, one thing to tack on, I'm going to go back to the timeline because I skimmed over this graphic a little bit, but really tiny in the corner, it says 2024, and that actually should be 2025. So we just wanted to, to spell out, and we will speak to some of the timing, uh, the implications of this project and how they relate to timing here in a moment too. But this is... Um, according to the dollars coming in. So recognition that this is our proposed timeline um, in ideal state. And if we don't, um, based on kind of the decision process and your guidance, if we um, don't secure the funds for this scale of project that we need, then that postpones the timing, which is not really what any of us are after, but just wanting to be transparent about that piece. So back to where we were. Yeah, so again, this, this really provides a foundation as we go forward with the next steps, um, specifically putting out an RFP for a design team once funding is, is in place. So this particular picture um, is really a diagrammatical representation of the uh, sort of the uh, expected program of the facility. Um, it won't, you know, probably won't look exactly like this, but from a spatial standpoint, this is really representative of where we've landed with the consultant. So um, this particular graph shows uh, an adult stabilization wing to the left on the west side, a youth stabilization component on the right, and then um, the gray um, parking lot areas to the south, east, and a little bit on the north um, with obvious landscaping. Mm -hmm. This also provides a sally port entrance to provide uh, a real high level of privacy for our clients and also um, sort of more of a secure entrance for all the uh, various entities that could provide support for bringing our clients to this facility. And um, as we were going through this process, there were a, a number of uh, requirements at the state level for defining this program. So for instance, in the uh, walk-in and arrival area and the intake area and in represented in the orange and also via the Sally port, um, it, we discovered and had talked to the state that uh, from a licensure standpoint, there needs to be two different providers for uh, one for the youth and one for the adult programs. So we thought initially that we'd be able to provide a lot of economy of scale with this with this particular layout because a lot of the admin services in the middle would be able to sort of share that service um, which may still be possible but then realized when we have folks that come in the entrance um, we need to be able to help really guide them into one of those two programs and so those are the kind of things that we had worked through with our design team and also with the state licensure personnel um, so again, I think you know we're we're continuing to look for opportunities for um, you know to be as efficient with this facility as possible, but recognizing that we have certain limitations, also um, square foot limitations for certain areas, you know minimum requirements for restroom size, for um, you know central offices, for the respite unit, and again in the places that we would have recliners, there are certain uh, sort of standards that are established that we need to adhere to. Thank you, David. And I, I had asked David to just explain the visual a little bit so you all understood what we were looking at um, if you weren't completely distracted by the really large numbers on the left side that we'll speak to here. Um, and just to call out at the top, it, it reviews the services that we're hoping to provide. And if you didn't see at the bottom, option one, this is the full build. Um, so the recliners, we're kind of in process of re-identifying um, some of the program names for clarity's sake. So in the purple on the graphic, respite, that's referring to the recliners. Stabilization would be the beds. You'd have the adult beds on one side and youth beds on, a, on another. Again, these weren't our contracted designers, so this is not the design, but just kind of an idea of what would be required. Um, so, and as a reminder, you know, 14 recliners, which is the 23 hour and 59 minute stay, um, and then the 16 beds, which could be multiple days, um, most likely for folks stepping down from higher levels of care or who come in through the recliner program and, and and clearly need additional stabilization and support so they would be moved on. Um, and then the 12 beds for youth, which could be used short term or a long term, we would just have designated space for the safety of youth and their caregivers um, with an anticipated annual impact of 8,200 unique individuals. And again, that number came from our work with RI International and the data that we had collected and, and run through their algorithm. So um, the cost, I believe last time we came to you, it was around $19 million. And so um, we 
learned um, that that cost has gone up significantly. Um, and this again was the results provided from what the work that Clark Jost and their partners um, gave to us based on programmatic need. Um, it's actually very similar square footage to our original estimate around 29 to 30,000 square foot. So that hasn't changed. Um, and there's probably speculation on, on some of the pieces that have changed, but this is the number that we're working with. David and I have a breakdown of what that looks like totally available upon request. Um, so the current secured funding, which I have a slide at the very end today that will kind of spell out what we currently have and then some that's hopefully in the works. Currently in hand, we have 9.5 million, largely due in part to you all in your generous um, allocation of ARPA dollars and seed funding for that. Um, which gives us a gap of 18 million. Um, and then the other piece, as I mentioned, with the estimates that we've done around operational cost, there would be an esti estimated operational gap of $8.2 million, which would reduce year over year. And we do have the number spelled out for out to five years or so based on capacity as it gets utilized differently over, over time. Um, and how that's staffed. But that's, if we want the full meal deal right out of the gate, this is what we would be looking at. Um, so we had asked our consultants to then propose. Brittany, can I just make oh, one, you sure can. one additional point? Thank yeah. you so much. Is that um, although the operational gap does decline from 8.2 million, uh, the ongoing gap once the program is fully up to speed is anticipated at $5 million today. So I don't want it to seem like we would make a short-term investment and then it would be self-sustaining right now with the payment models that we have available to us. Now there's advocacy that we can do in this area, but right now we're looking at that $5 million ongoing gap. Thank you for that. Um, so we are providing two different options for a phased build um, that this is something that we received from our consultants and then talked through at length with our executive steering committee. So the first option, phased option that we're bringing option to um, is what our executive steering committee members have recommended based on how they evaluate the most urgent need. So this would be starting with phase one is starting with the recliner program. Again, adult recliners, 14 adult recliners. We actually have a youth element of the services included in both phased options because it, we all agree, the, the project team, the executive steering committee, um, behavioral health division, that youth are too much of an urgent need to not include in some fashion in the first round. Um, there is a bit of a caveat with the youth piece. If you'll see youth unit uh, in white, I added that. That's why it doesn't look as official in that top right corner. But that's because the youth piece is not included in the phased build option in either phase. It would be utilizing another existing space. Um, and the, that is really dependent on us running that RFP and learning if there is an existing provider locally or otherwise who could not only provide services but also provide a facility. Um, and there have been some conversations around some potential there. Um, that means we don't have a, a totally accurate cost estimate because that would be some minimal renovation cost rather than factoring into the build cost. So to call out the cost to build for the phase one portion of this option is 14 million, but that doesn't include um, the youth program but it would be a factor. We just need to kind of spell that out. So then phase two would be adding on the adult beds in that kind of hash mark area in the adult um, stabilization unit. So the capital gap that would remain when we're looking at option two um, for that phase one, kind of the thing we could build first with currently looking at a $4.5 million gap. And this also naturally impacts the operating gap. So to note, the recliner program, um, we have the least clarity on how to um, sustain that program operationally. Um, I suspect because it's it's newer in kind of the existing healthcare structure. So there's less um, billing codes and um, different payment mechanisms to refer to to know how to sustain that operational. So it's, it's possibly a larger risk on the operational side for, sus for sustaining that as the first first phase, um, but then lower cost on the build. That's good. Yeah, question. questions? Thank you. Quick clarifying question to Director Grade. Is this year over year, does the operating gap in year over year reduce proportionally and sort of at that same rate as what you mentioned before, or is it a whole different equation on this So scenario? it is. It, it, 
It does reduce down to just over $4 million a year. The two programs that the Executive Steering Committee felt were the most essential for our community are also the most expensive to operate uh, in terms of having the most operational gap. Now, there's a reason that those services are not provided in our community today, right? It's that the finances don't work out. So that is why we have these gaps, and it is why that is the most urgent need for us. Um, so a, a smaller proportion of the annual deficit, uh, operating deficit, is in those adult stabilization bets. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so then option three, is the, is the other um, proposed phased build and really simple, just kind of a swap. So it would be starting with um, the stabilization beds for adults and then it'd be the same caveat around the youth, the same plan of, of hopefully using an existing youth space. And also just to call out, folks could stay in the beds for a short term. They are not required to stay multiple days. So it could serve a similar function to the recliners in that sense. They could come and stay for 23 hours. It's just in a bedded unit. Um, or they could have the option to stay longer if needed. So not much to elaborate on. It's really all the same specs. It's just changing the order, which obviously impacts the cost. Um, so this would put us at a capital gap of $8.2 million for that first phase one to be complete. Um, and one thing to add is we don't have a concrete um, kind of mapping out of the timeline for when phase two would begin on either of the phased options. That's something we would need to sit down and really spell out and then consider the accompanying staff cost for um, kind of a two-faceted uh, project management approach. And we just don't have that, so I just wanted to, to clarify that. But we could we could learn if, if asked to do so. Um, and then similarly, so the operating gap, um, uh, less consequential because we have some existing mechanisms to pay for those, those beds. If I might add one thing too. Um, it's interesting as we've been talking at the state level, we're the only one in the state currently looking at potentially um, providing a youth and an adult facility as one effort. So um, this is sort of breaking some new ground at a state level and presents you know, certain challenges, again, from a licensure and an operational standpoint. Um, we've been trying to explore some efficiencies, again, with uh, proximities to other existing facilities that we have in that specific area. And uh, again, would welcome you know, your insight and wisdom as far as uh, sort of how to proceed with our efforts, so. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna hand it back to you, Eve. Well, thank you. So this is just a summary of the current uh, funding that has been secured for this project. Of course, most of that uh, from the Lane County Board of Commissioners and $1.5 million. I see Mr. Kyler here in the audience and appreciate the work that the policy team does for us every year in submitting these applications for congressionally directed spending. We did just receive our formal notification of award uh, because even though it's congressionally directed, you still have a 20 plus page grant application <laughs> that uh, you have to fill out. So. Um, then our, uh, our current funding requests, uh, Brittany mentioned the meetings with funding partners. Uh, we don't have formal commitments right now, but we are continuing to engage our partners and work toward uh, a community uh, contribution. What we did hear from the OHA in a meeting with them was that they are not looking for the state to fully fund these facilities operationally. They are looking for a local commitment. So um, we are trying to identify dollars to be able to do that with. Uh, we also, uh, again, thanks to our wonderful uh, policy team, have a couple of existing asks, $5 million, uh, with, that we will hopefully hear about by the end of summer, maybe, when we have a state budget, and then uh, one point, another $1.5 million congressionally directed spending request. Um, the, the piece to point out here is that from a capital side, if we look at the recommendation from the Executive Steering Committee, we would, uh, if we were to say receive five million or the majority of that ask from the state, we would be able to break ground on option two. Uh, we still don't have an answer for how we cover the operating gap, however. And, um, and so that's really, and you can probably move to the next slide, which is just the, um, 
help us part of this, which is uh, we want to move on this facility. If we move without identifying how we are going to sustain this facility operationally, uh, that is, of course, a big financial liability to the county. Um, or worst case scenario, we build a program that we have to shut down after spending all of this capital. So um, trying to get some thoughts and guidance about how we move forward, I do think um, there is great promise in the, the youth option that, um, that we're talking to some community partners about with existing beds. There will still be a large operating deficit. And so if we were to move forward with running that facility, the benefits of that would be, gosh, we could test our pro forma. We could test the billing. We could test um, our assumptions around volumes in the community. And we could get kids out of the emergency room who are waiting in a single, like a jail cell, is what it turns out to be in the hospital doesn't mean it to be. It's just they have to strip the room down completely so that, folk, so that these youth don't harm themselves, right? And they sit there for a week or weeks on end, kids who are in crisis. So, so the need is dire um, in providing a better facility for these folks. Um, if we were to open that facility, though, the only dollars today that I have to pull from are the dollars that we have assigned for capital to the remainder of the facility. So how 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 do you how what are your thoughts on how we pace this? Because the direction we got last time was get something going faster as long as it doesn't slow down the full meal deal. And now we know that we don't think there's an option for doing that, that there will be trade-offs no matter which way we go. And I think that's what we're hoping to hear from you all today is to get your thoughts and direction uh, on how we proceed in, in the best next step fashion on this project. So thank you, appreciate it. Well, not exactly what I'd hope to hear, but. It is what I expected to hear. <laughs> so, um, with that, I'll look to the board to see if we have any questions right off top. Uh, Commissioner Buck. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Although, as the chair said, it's um, not the best scenario. Um, crossing my fingers and hoping that we get some funding from the state um, would would provide a lot of hope. I think for getting this going. Um, but we will always come down to the problem of paying for its ongoing operations and how we do that. Has there been any discussion about a levy of any kind um, that you think the public might actually support? Have we explored that particular option? If we haven't, could we explore? I mean, we'd have to ask the public if it's even something that they would consider. Um, and maybe they would and maybe they wouldn't. It's also not an ideal option in order to, to do this. As we know, with a public safety levy, you have to go out and renew it all the time, and it runs the risk of not being renewed. Um, but I'm just trying to think of funding mechanisms that the public might support. Um, clearly, the state is not going to provide enough ongoing operational funding. And they told you point blank that they want local interest. That means we need to consider what that would look like. Um, also, is there bond funding that we could do for this particular project internally that may or may not require a public vote? <clears throat> Um, we have options that way, but I, I don't know what, what's available and how it would apply in this particular context, but I'd be very interested in understanding that. I, too, feel a huge urgency in order to do this, um, but it sounds like the biggest issue is ongoing operational funding. And so what kind of financial options are available, I think, is maybe the next step what we can do internally, or if we need to go out to the public and ask them, is this something that you would be willing to support? And in what financial mechanism would that be? That's kind of a broad net you just throw out. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, might, I might just add really quickly that there are still trees that we can shake. Um, we would like to put on the United Front agenda uh, that 
uh, we need Medicare to cover stabilization center visits. Part of a large part of the operational gap today is that Medicare does not cover stabilization center visits. Most commercial insurers follow Medicare. So commercially insured patients are not covered in a stabilization center and will end up in the emergency room because it's cheaper for them. They, because they'd be billed coming to the stabilization center. Um, that would be a huge uh, a piece of legislation or, or rule that we could advocate for. Um, there also are opportunities around the codes that are used for stabilization center and the reimbursement amounts that are placed on those codes. I do think that we have opportunities in advocacy with the OHA and the CCOs in order to get better reimbursement rates uh, for the codes that we would be billing out of the stabilization center. Do I think any of this is going to close the gap 100%? No, I don't. So I do think that we have to identify some sort of alternative sustainable funding source, but I don't think that the numbers that we have today in terms of the gap are necessarily going to be the numbers in the future. The, the, thing, the thing is, as we all feel the urgency, if we wait to solve all these issues, we're not providing the service. Um, if, but if we move forward, we're taking a larger risk. And, um, and since we don't feel comfortable making that decision, we're asking you to help us. <laughs> well, I have thoughts. i finish with Commissioner Buck and then go to uh, Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you. Just uh, as a response, personally, I'm willing to move faster with some risk, but not so much so that it's a major financial <clears throat> burden on our taxpayers. I don't want to take so much risk that we open the facility and then we have to close it. That would be just worse, right? Um, and yes, we need to pursue the avenue of getting Medicare to fund visits, but I kind of feel like that is going to be a long-term issue and it requires an act of Congress, which we know may take a very long time. Um, and I don't want to wait that long, um, but I'd really like in another meeting to come back and talk to us about various financial options. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. Vice Chair Trier. Thank you. Um, before I um, respond there, I just want to rewind a little bit and appreciate um, Dr. Gishohi's presentation. It's so important that the community gets to hear the breadth of the services we are providing, much less like when we talk about addressing uh, the unhoused in our community. So much of our work is invisible, invisible to the general public, so it's really important to see how much we are doing. So thank you for teeing us up with that context. Um, and thank you, Director Gray basically proactively started down the path of where I was going, which is what are the policy advocacy opportunities to impact um, billable services or other operational dollars and whether that's different for youth or adults. I imagine the answer is generally no. The, the fixes are the fixes regardless of the age of the folks being served, is that right? Except for Medicare. Mm -hmm, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel similarly to Commissioner Buck, which is trying to find that balance, which is continuing the momentum and the urgency, minimizing, but we're not going to eliminate the risk probably because the only other option, the only way to eliminate the risk is get all the ducks in a row before we act, and that's just going to take too long. I also think there is, and I've seen it happen with capital projects, with all manner of types of initiatives and campaigns, there are some funders that are waiting to be those last mile funders. And they want to see all the other throw-ins and the progress and kind of come in and be the hero or secure their investment in a way that shows, oh, if I get in now, this is really going to happen and it's only going to happen if I get in. So banking on that I, I don't think is unreasonable to, to an extent. Identifying what those, <laughs> what those funding streams are is, a, is, is another piece of work. Um, and. I guess what I'm curious about is the timeline. Where is the, it's time to do this or don't do this, and how that relates to not only this legislative, um, this cycle, this budget cycle, but we can go back and ask. So again, if the state comes through with the $5 million ask, for example, that's another moment of now we're this close. We've done that before. We go back uh, subsequent sessions. Um, and ask for more money, and same with the um, community-directed spending from Congress. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of where on that, when is the moment where we really have to decide we're either doing this or we're not, regardless of which model. 
we're trying to move forward with. So my sense is that that decision could come pretty quickly on the youth side, depending on the results of our RFP. If we can use an existing facility, we can get moving pretty quickly. Um, if we uh, if we are able to identify at least short-term funding for a pilot program, the great thing about that too is the facility already exists. So if it starts and then it has to stop because something was misjudged, um, that we would be in no worse shape than we are today. Uh, so there's, there is, I think, some hope and promise there. Uh, in terms of the adult side of the programming, I would say that's dependent upon the state budget. So it could be as soon as the end of the summer that we're making some of those decisions. Uh, if the dollars come through for us and if they do not, then we have some more work on the capital side before we really have to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, further discussion? Then I'll take sure. my turn. Sure, no. Oh, go ahead. If you want to go first, go ahead. I, I, I'm just typing so many notes here. I'm not ready to ask questions yet. But. Well, then if I, I I'm going to throw my cards on the table. I, I'm in favor of getting something going. And, uh, and by testimony, uh, this sounds as though we are ready, potentially, uh, with the youth element. Um, that, that, could, uh, that could be something that we get out of the gate fairly quickly on. We've been doing research on that for a long, long time with a lot of different uh, avenues. Mr. Mokraisi, you remember that we looked down the salmon pot at the Serbu for a while, you know, or the alternate for this west pot at the Serbu. Um, so, you know, we've done a lot of talking about it. There's a great deal of interest in the community, much broader even than many of us anticipate in, in particularly serving youth. And I think the return on our investment with youth can be pretty significant because we're catching people before um, cycles have set in, for instance. Hopefully, we're catching uh, young people before cycles of, of uh, uh, social deterioration, whatever you want to call it, has, have set in. So for me, I like that. Uh, looking at the, the, the youth element, look for the RFP. I know we have the facility out that's adjacent to the old armory, I believe, um, the old armory, which is now DD services. Um, and you know, and I like the thought that you've said that uh, if we misjudge, heaven forbid that we would misjudge anything, but uh, then we are, we have less uh, outlay. Um, so, so I'm in favor of that. Without derailing, moving as quickly as we can on the adult facilities and getting those things in place, because we know we need those. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm also in favor of, uh, you call it shaking trees. Um, and you know, perhaps if we're out of the gate early on this, um, the, uh, the the possibility of uh, getting an act of Congress may not may not be that far away from from reality because of the urgency that we are not the only ones that recognize the urgency. And I do have a question before I go to Commissioner Lovell. Um, could this be wrapped into the FQHC? Has that uh, discussion occurred? Uh, um, so we're going to get into acronym soup here, and uh, Dr. Gashohi, you're going to have to help me with CCBHC. Um, Stabilization Center the Services. Rule. You have to say the acronym before you can, or the meaning before you can say the acronym <laughs> for those viewing. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm going to need some help. But um, FQHCs uh, we are not really a mechanism for stabilization services, but there is an alternative structure, a CCBHC. And Dr. Yashohi, do you want to speak to, <laughs> maybe you can remember what all those letters mean better than I can, and then speak to some of the conversations you've had with um, Peace Health, who is our local CCBHC, about how they might be able to help us. Sure. And uh, before you do that, if the answer is no, that's stupid. Say that first, and you don't have to say anything else. But <laughs> please continue. No, actually, there is opportunity there. So the uh, CCBHC is community-based health center. So this is the model, really, truly, that fits behavioral health. So at the FQHC, the Federally Qualified Health Centers, uh, primarily the pr uh, the medical, so primary care that has embedded behavioral health. Mm -hmm. So. On the side of behavioral health, so the CCBHCs are largely that entity that serves the larger behavioral health, so also integrating the medical component. So locally, uh, Peace Health is one of those certified CCBHC in our community. So there has been efforts to expand. So they were one of the pilot projects that uh, were funded in our community to uh, uh, to serve the community. So that what a CCBHC is, um, 
assigned to do is to look at the broad uh, spectrum of the services that are needed for the uh, behavioral health population. So they operate the same as we do at, at the, uh, uh, as an FQHC, but it's a different model. So through CCBHCs, the certain uh, entities have been able to fund uh, um, stabilization centers. So this is how Deschutes was able to fund some of their stabilization center. They have enhanced funding to be able to do that. It's not so in the FQHC. So we've been having conversations both at the state with the expansion, which uh, this time around, we are not able to have another CCBHC because we were looking to see could we be a part of the CCBHC. And the expansion is limited to a few other areas that do not have one. So we already have one. So they're looking at areas that don't have any. Uh, but we have been talking with Peace Health about a potential uh, partnership. So what could they, as a local SCCBHC, do to help us, maybe even in terms of uh, reimbursement, kind of have the stabilization be subsumed under the CCBHC? So we have conversations they are promising to see what could, could be done in that partnership, because there be an IGA that could help us with some of the, those funding. So we are yet to unpack what that looks like, but there is some uh, opportunity through the CCBHC. There's one of the trees to shake. That's a certified community behavioral health center. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Then I, I may have some more questions. I think, uh, you know, I've kind of laid all my cards on the table. I think getting something going, getting something going for youth, uh, we can count on that, some of that last mile. Um, uh, support in particular for youth. We've experienced that at a lot of different levels. Commissioner Lovell. Thank you, Chair. Um, wow, we're unpacking a lot here, aren't we, today? So I, I just appreciate what um, uh, your report said on page three when you were under discussion item one. You said both RFPs will prioritize the ability to expedite efforts in standing up a stabilization center if an existing facility is found viable. So we're circling around that uh, that topic right now, and David and I have talked about some things. I even um, had coffee uh, last week with uh, the director of Looking Glass, Craig Opperman, who had this out-of-the-box idea of starting exactly what you're talking about, a youth facility in the building that we already are leasing to them uh, at, in the MLK complex. So uh, if, if I had to pick and choose, and I'm, I'm totally agreeing with what all my colleagues have said, uh, especially Commissioner Buck, when she threw out some ideas about levies and bonds and let's get it paid for any way we can, you know, Deschutes County realized that uh, they surveyed the public and the public's outcry for what they needed is what directed what they did. And I think maybe um, if we have to make some tough decisions to accommodate some tougher decisions, you know, the, the, the community needs to get behind us if we do that. And, um, you know, my son was in care under the Deschutes system for almost a year. And they've got a, a really wonderful system there. It's not perfect. I mean, when you deal with mental health, you're dealing with a lot of loose cogs and screws that don't tighten the way they should, all that kind of things. Um, I get that. But um, as we've heard today, our youth is a really sound investment if we're going to make some needle moving progress in the adult uh, sector. Um, as I'm thinking about youth, you always think about 18 and under, but I'm almost wondering if we decided to just do a youth portion in an existing building, so like we said, if it goes totally sideways where we haven't risked the, all the marbles, um, if that would be something that we would could hedge our bets for like 25 and under, what does that really entail? Is there, is there a state requirement that keeps us in certain age groups with that? There are licensure I knew you were going to say that. And, um, and that is one, one of the downsides of an existing facility is that we would have a floor to our age. So um, Peace Health has seen youth as young as age six who are kept um, in those little rooms um, for their care. And it is unlikely that we could find an existing facility that could go down that young. But um, for maximum age, do you all remember uh, what it would be? I think it's 20, 24. Oh, yeah. 24. And I do think there is maybe some more wiggle room on going lower, younger actually, and with youth licensing it gets more complex because um, Oregon Health Authority and DHS are both involved. Um, but licensing is a barrier, but also programmatically serving such a 
diverse age range from a six-year-old to a 15-year-old in the same space would have some nuance to it and not impossible. But um, so I, it, it's possible to go younger too, I guess is what I'm saying, but I think up to 24. So, so I've got a few other questions. I mean, as we're talking about this, what's in my mind is what's the list of the facilities that we had looked at? Maybe that would be helpful for people to look at so we're not beating the drum on, hey, what about that corner drugstore and all the other properties that we see around town? And then I think the over looming question for me is what's it worth? I mean, we're going to have to ask the community what's it worth? What's it worth to you to, to make healing happen in this arena? I mean, what is it worth a, a 50 cents more on our taxes? Is it worth, you know, the businesses saying, hey, we'll kick in an X percentage, whatever? I mean, we really have to ask ourselves that question as a community. What are we going to do and how and what can we do with the biggest amount of impact with what the resources we have? We can't do everything. I mean, I keep complaining all the time that we're spreading the butter so thin, the bread still tastes like bread. You know what I mean? And we need to really find a way where we can make an impact now. Because as I've said before in meetings, I don't want to talk to people around the community when they lose people that are dear to them from suicide or other means because of mental health that we didn't do what we should have done sooner. Anything's better than nothing. Can I add one comment too just around the, the levy piece, which is well beyond my scope and pay grade, but just to say I think we've done an, a unique amount of community engagement early on in this work, and so I just wonder if that's something to hold as, you're, as we're all considering that potential, that the community members, you know, for how far out our timeline is, they already know quite a bit about what we're doing, and we still have um, additional efforts to pursue. So as far as getting community buy-in and educating community members so that they can make an informed decision about what this is worth, um, I think we have a unique stage to do that. And also in terms of facilities, you mentioned list of facilities. We have only looked at one today. We are only aware of one in our facility and you and I have similar friends. So um, so I think, but we they want- still our friends? <laughs> we want the RFP process to take place though because we don't want the people we know to cloud our, our unbiased judgment around opportunities for others in the community. Well said. And uh, Brittany, in my experience, you. To make metaphors, you punch way above your pay, pay grade. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Very true. And so far, the conversations with all the stakeholder conversations that we've had, we have not met anybody that doesn't think this is a good idea. So I don't think in terms of community buy-in that it would be you know, a battle to get people behind what we are trying to do. Everybody believes in what we are sharing. and it really sees the value. So that said, I don't know how far they would want to go to make this happen. But as far as we can tell, there is a lot of community buy-in. Well, then, um, can we state that you've heard youth, uh, you've heard um, uh, existing facilities with mutual friends uh, in, in the conversation. You've heard about um, exciting people about the last mile. Um, and asking people, what is it worth to you? Yeah. So is that a, a good synopsis of what we've presented you, and do you need and, more? Uh, it may be just head nods around, um, would folks like us to come back with an item around f different types of local funding options? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Well, is uh, anything further that you'd like to add? Um, anything you'd like to hear from us? Just one more comment, I think, to what's been already said. We, we've had some meetings and discussions with local businesses around this particular site, and a lot of those business owners are really leaning in, and I think folks are starting to think, are there some creative ways to help support this type of effort? Um, as Commission, Commissioner Trigger said, you know, is there some sort of angel fund mm -hmm. type entity or person out there? And I believe that there are probably multiple as long as like you said, maybe they're the ones that can help make up the last, the last bit of effort on this. So, last mile. Yeah. Then, if I may, I, Mr. Kyler, you've been sitting here, and uh, <laughs> and you pay a lot of attention to a lot of different things. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to the conversation at this point in time? I will open the mic to you. No is okay, or <laughs> <laughs> yes is okay too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, commissioners, um, uh, Chairman Farr, I, you know, I, um, 
I think you heard it today. We do have a $5 million ask in at the state uh, legislature for a capital construction ask. Um, you've all aware of the situation up there. The, uh, the Senate is at a complete standstill, uh, in, including today, it did not readjourn. Um, so, um, a reconvene, sorry. So there's, there's a lot of unknowns about that $5 million ask. Now, what we understand is, is that if the legislature does get all the way to June 25th, which it, which it is sort of the only option right now because there's no sine die resolution, so they, they probably have to sort of coast all the way to the 25th, but our understanding is, is that the governor would very quickly call for a special session. And if it's just a session to deal with budgetary issues, conceivably that could get done in a day or two. And then we would know about the five, at least about the $5 million ask. Um, and so that, that's, that's the update I have on, in terms of the capital construction side of things. Um, I will say that I'm, I'm interested to hear more about the, what I learned here today was more about the health licensing office and some of their standards. Um, and it does feel to me like stabilization centers are, there's not a whole lot of guidance in statute. The only guidance was, was that um, the health authority would promulgate rules to define them and license them. Um, you know, I, I do wonder, I would love to know, for example, how much it's adding onto the cost to have that sort of dual entry or dual staffing model. And those are the kinds of things that, that we might want to put on our agenda, legislative agenda, in addition to um, Director Gray's suggestion about the Medicare change, that we could put those on an agenda for a future legislative session. Excellent. And let me ask you this. Um, uh, Director Gray is a part of the uh, AOC's Local Government Advisory Committee. Is that a, a possible avenue? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that surprised me this session was there was really not a lot of discussion about behavioral health stabilization. And um, my understanding was that OHA had, um, had sort of promised to deliver more analysis to support a budgetary ask this session, but was unable to do that. And so you'll recall sort of in the waning days of the Brown administration, and during the campaign, OHA was in a bit of a tenuous situation. They're still in a bit of a tenuous situation. I think that um, one of the things that struck me about the last LGAC meeting was that we were listening to OHA, and I think we've done that now at a couple of the LGAC meetings. And I'm kind of thinking maybe it's time for us to put some presentations onto the table. This one today might be an excellent presentation to put on the table and to really start to talk about it. I will say that I think, um, to your point, Commissioner Lovell, you know, one of the things that, um, that we're doing in Oregon right now is we spend, we're spending an, an, an enormous amount of money um, on treating people, my, and this is, I'm gonna get into my opinion here a little bit, but we treat people to fulfill their obligation to the court. So they could come in to our custody in a, in a experiencing a crisis. That crisis doesn't get better necessarily in jail. They present in court and then a judge has only one tool, which is to send them into community restoration. So the, the, the police agency, the court, and in certain cases the state hospital is spending an inordinate amount of money on these kinds of defendants when we could be presenting a much better model that could have better outcomes and doesn't treat just to fulfill that obligation to the court, but actually treats for their underlying. Com and what, what one of the things I've been talking about in the legislature this session is the need to do a side-by-side -side analysis of that because I truly believe we have a justice reinvestment moment here. It's not as easy as moving money from bucket A into bucket B, but we have done it before in the state of Oregon with really trying to say, hey, we're spending money in the wrong places. How can we make a reinvestment into a better model? And I think we actually do have a much better model here if we could actually get some demonstration dollars or some analytical work done to look at those existing costs that are that are the state is budgeting for right now 
uh, and it's not cheap. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things I've been talking about to anybody who would listen to me in, in Salem this session. And we've gotten actually a fair amount of traction uh, on that issue over the course of the last uh, four or five months. Well, we do have the ear of directors from OHA. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, short notice, but we uh, set the agenda for the next LGAC meeting on Thursday of this week. Director Gray will not be at the next LGAC meeting. So maybe the July agenda is a good time to uh, look forward to uh, maybe putting some bugs in the ears of uh, Oregon Health Authority. I might want to, I know we've had some directors from other agencies and it, in that case, it might be well to invite somebody from OJD to mm -hmm. think about, you know, there's been, there definitely has been an improvement between OHA and OJD in, in terms of able to share data. Um, and so I'm assuming they can do sharing of costs now too, um, um, better than they previously were able to. We have a few minutes to, uh, to mull on that to see if that's something that would, would uh, move us would move under the agenda. And like I say, they've been we've been listening to them. That's a large part of the initial part of that. But uh, then uh, a part of that is how can we, as a group of 36 counties, give them advice as to be more as to how to be more effective with the uh, the work that happens in the counties. So perfect. I think partnering with Deschutes County on that presentation would be wonderful. Yeah, bravo. I think that's a great idea. You know, Deschutes is really the up and operating model um, and you know so that's been a little bit of a challenge for us to talk about well you know we're not we're not operational yet mm -hmm. so we're really still in that sort of advocacy role of trying to to, to, to lower that gap in terms of the remaining capital necessary yeah. and they seem quite willing over there to share uh, information so and uh, advice so, perfect and Janice has been at most of those she is a bit at every one of them yeah. yeah so perfect thank you thank you well um then do we have semi-marching orders uh we know what's going to happen and uh, uh we've, you've been asked to for another presentation regarding uh, uh local possibilities so. yes thank you so much very good thank you very much for a superb presentation and Brittany, yesterday well done yeah very good Okay, well, we're moving uh, rapidly. I think we'll, let's just chat for a while until about five past five. Right. <laughs> Somebody's car is warming up. Tell my daughter that. No, man. <laughs> okay. And, uh, I you will. We'll move down uh, the agenda to uh, Commissioner's business. I'm going to mention that uh, before we leave this evening, I will be reading us into executive session for our 9 a.m. Uh, executive me uh, session meeting tomorrow. So uh, um, announcements and or future board assignment requests. Let's more from. So um, we usually do anyway. Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you, Chair. Um, feels like a long time ago, but remember this morning? <laughs> this morning at 9, you started us off reading a really uh, powerful and important statement. So thank you again for doing that. And I would like to ask um, my colleagues for head nods to direct the administrator to work with staff and essentially codify that statement in resolution format. Um, we have done this declaring racism a threat to public health. We've done this uh, denouncing uh, white nationalism. We've done this in all manner of other matters that protect and signify through policy our commitment to protecting um, vulnerable people in our community. And I would um, make that request and then leave it to the administrator and staff to figure out exactly how to adapt the wording and put it into some of the therefores and whereases of a resolution that then is passed with a board order and becomes policy. Okay, um, look around for that. I think, uh, you know, there's a question regarding policy. I'd, I'd love to see what that looks like, what, uh, what um, uh, staff could bring back, Mr. Markowski, regarding what that might look like. So we could have a broad discussion as a board. So, um, Okay. Uh, just questions or uh, questions? Have, yeah, questions. Uh, I, I'm I'm just a little, want some clarification about are, are we ad adapting another policy on top of other policies about laws that already exist to protect our citizens against uh, these kinds of things? I'm just kind of wondering if we're just layering some things on unnecessarily. I think it's a, a resolution, a, a statement of commitment in a policy form, much like the other resolutions I've referenced that we've passed previously. 
I'm still gearing my, my thoughts here a little bit. Um, I, I, I am totally like in, in support of uh, people's uh, challenges and struggles and to help them get through that. I, I'm just kind of uh, still at odds about how uh, policy is gonna change that. I mean, let's say for example, every day I, I wake up and I try to treat my neighbor better. And I don't think uh, any policy that we would establish would change that about the way I wake up and live. And I'm wondering also too about the oath that we swore to on the uh, Oregon Constitution section one, section 20 that says uh, equality of privileges and immunities of all citizens. And let me just read what it says because I think it's important because it kind of lays on my heart of why I'm having a, an issue with this. Is no law shall be passed granting to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which upon the same term shall not equally belong to all citizens. And so I, I, I just kind of question, you know, every time we, we have laws in place that really do what they're supposed to do. And sometimes I think adding policies on that just um, tends to muddy the waters a bit. And that's just my only thought. So this is an assignment request asking for three head nods to create a resolution. If there are three head nods, that happens, and then we can have a discussion and, and, and a vote on adopting the resolution or not. That's all this is. And so that's what I'm asking for. And, and uh, Mr. Mokarajski, if you get the three head nods on that, is it fairly clear what is being asked for? I think so. I, you call it a resolution. I would call it a board order. I mean, that's really how we codify board actions. Every time the, you had a number of orders today that you voted on, either in the consent calendar or in the regular calendar, so we would put together a board order that reflects the language, the substance of the language that you read today, because that's what I heard you suggest. Um, and we would bring that back to the board at a future meeting, probably in the next you know, month or so. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it seems pretty straightforward if that's the will of the board. And it would not contain any lane code changes? No, or so the way that, the, yeah, the, um, it would actually, and you, you've adopted, I mean, a board order really is to reflect the action of the board. So when the board takes an action, otherwise you meet every week and that boards, we've had boards for as long, I mean, as long as, the county has existed, right? And so the, the board orders are really a record of the action that the, it did very different from an ordinance. You adopt an ordinance that requires a public hearing and two votes, that goes into the code and that becomes a law, mm -hmm. right? Um, that on some level has some enforcement mechanisms. A board order is, I think we, we view it as, uh, we consider it both a reflection of the board's actions and a statement of policy. Mm -hmm. If you look at the level of policy making in the organization, it's the administrative procedure manual, which the county administrator has the authority to set. So they, those would be day-to-day -day operating procedures. Administrator sets those. Then we do board orders and the lane manual. Then we do ordinances and the code. Um, and then beyond that, it's the lane charter. Does that make sense? So okay, if you go top down, charter, code, manual, APM. Mm -hmm. Then would it be safe and safe to say that uh, um, it would be, such an order would be a re reiteration of existent ways we do business? It wouldn't be suggesting a new way we do business? I, I, I think so, based on what you read this morning. I have not seen that language, but I think it's certainly consistent with uh, the board's uh, several other adopted uh, for example, the board several years ago adopted, I believe, a board order um, regarding racism as a public health uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. I thought, did we do homelessness as a public health health crisis? We did the housing. Ago, How, maybe yeah. it was housing as a public health crisis. So, you know, we can, we, if you'd like, that to me, that's another assignment mm -hmm. to sort of do all that research of the different actions that you've taken. Mm -hmm. um, but a board order really is the way for the board to establish to um, to document its positions on, on various issues. I don't just, uh, you're asking me off the top of my head here. I don't think that what you read would necessarily change policy or practice, but it does seem to me that it would, it would, um, um, it would document, uh, the specificity of that language as an action by the board. Excellent, then uh, with this you would have my head nod. Um, 
with Mr. Mokarajski's um, uh, explanation of that. Also, if you could do the uh, what you suggested as a kind of an adjunct uh, assignment request that you put the other orders in the last couple of years uh, together that are similar to this, so that we're not um, you know just progressing will ye nil ye on um, on you know board orders that uh, that it there is a uh, rhyme and reason to the way we do things. Is that uh, does that is that clear? And does that uh, go along with your request? Um, I, I don't require the second part, but I'm not opposed to it. They're all on our website, but I have yeah. no opposition to to it. It's just more for the staff to organize, but sure. Then at this point, you, I see three heads, which is what our requirement is. So okay. very good. Thank you. OK, then um, any further announcements or agenda team requests? Then I have an agenda team request, but it's not really an agenda team request. A, a few weeks ago, I asked for head nods regarding Boating Safety Month, a proclamation uh, on Boating Safety Month, which also includes a... Uh, Do we get vests? <laughs> yes. They're at every boat ramp in Lane oh, County. They're hanging change. there. <laughs> um, they're the, what they call uh, May West vests. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Right. Um, the, so, I don't call them that. No, I, I don't call them that either. Uh, I call them um, the Class Torture. A throwable life preservers. <laughs> but um, so the um, so my request then is, uh, as we talked about the agenda team, is that we have a uh, the next board meeting, which is June thirteenth, that we have a presentation of colors, a proclamation on boating safety month, a two paragraph pro proclamation on boating safety month, which would morph into boating boating safety lifetime. You know, discussing. Both boating safety in general, and then uh, a retirement of colors at the uh, at the 9 a.m. mark on next week's agenda. Um, so we did uh, this morning. We put a placeholder on that, pending this approval by the board that we do have that on next next week's agenda. And, and Ms. Jones is listening, with really alert ears as to how we handle this. So, please. That was a tough one to get through, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it, it started out. It, <laughs> on a different track completely. So um, with the board's uh, um, unanimous approval, then uh, that will be at 9 a.m. on next month's, next uh, week's agenda. Sweet. Which will be a presentation of colors, a, a short proclamation regarding boating safety, and a retirement of colors. Okay. Is that June 13th, you said, or 14th? That is uh, 13th. Well, is Tuesday 14th, is the, uh, yeah. Very good. Then, if I don't hear a voice from the sky, we've done okay on that. And I don't. Chair, Chair Farr, you do. Right. A voice from the sky. Just, <laughs> just for clarification, I will be coordinating the coordination of colors, but did you ask for a proclamation as well? That is something that I had intended to handle myself. Uh, just a, okay. And it's just a, a, a pre-written uh, proclamation regarding voting safety. And it's not just boating safety, um, Ms. Jones, it's, it's water safety in general, yeah. Good timing. In that my seven-year-old son declared that he was going to swim across the yeah. sun. Did I say son? Uh, my, my grandchild yeah, declared that they were going to swim across the Willamette River on Sunday, and I had to put my foot down. <laughs> so. oh, Very good. Then uh, with that, any further um, future assignments? Mr. McRicey, a review of assignments. Uh, Commissioner Trier's request to draft a board order for the board's consideration that incorporates the language from Commissioner Farr's um, pride statement this morning, and then Commissioner Farr's request to have a presentation of colors, proclamation, and recognition of voter, voter B O A T <laughs> the uh, safety <laughs> month. Uh, Do I have to Tuesday, put up with this <laughs> forever? <laughs> Just, just clear, trying to be clear for the record. I have the gavel here, so. <laughs> That's all. I, I think that covers it very well. Thank you. Um, any questions or corrections? <laughs> okay, thank you for that last part. Clear. Then at this point, I will read us into executive session, uh, which will uh, commence at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning in the Board of County Board of Commissioners. Uh, um, Board, uh, what's it called? BCC. Conference room. Conference BCC room, thank conference you. Room. The BCC conference room, it is late in the day, but we're out of here before 5 o'clock, Commissioner. 
Um, the Board of Commissioners will meet in executive session to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. This executive session is held pursuant to ORS 192.6602D, which allows the Board of Commissioners to meet in executive session for the purposes listed. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the de deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. We reserve the right to come back out into public session should the need arise. 